Now, meat shouldn't be the staple in your diet, but it should be a side dish in the face of a lot of good quality plant foods that help you to deal with the need you have for phytochemicals. It turns out that you find in the meat of some of these high quality grass fed meats or goat or whatever, that there are as high levels of phytochemicals in there as you find in plants. You are what you eat and you are whatever you are eating has eaten. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> And, and on my podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, I had this incredible rangeland scientist, Fred Provenza, who wrote a book called Nourishment, talk about the emerging research from Duke University on phytochemicals in grass-finished beef. So if, if animals are left to forage on hundreds of varieties of plants, they're, they're literally eating the medicines in all of those plants all the time. And they're seeking out different plants for different properties in terms of medicine or in terms of the the uh, nutrient density or the vitamins and minerals. And so it, it turns out that you find in the meat of some of these high quality grass fed meats or goat or whatever, goat milk, that there are as high levels of phytochemicals in there as you find in plants. For example, goats who are eating certain shrubs and are left to forage around in the wild will have as high levels of catechins, which are in green tea, as green tea, which is really remarkable Like to think about, wow, so I think b back to the, the question of what about meat, the studies about meat, most of the studies on meat were done on obviously feedlot beef, not grass finished beef or wild beef, right? And, and there's a great study uh, on, on a kangaroo meat in Australia where they, they fed people the exact amount of kangaroo meat versus feedlot beef. And they found that with the feedlot beef inflammation in their body went up, with the kangaroo meat, it went down. <laughs> and, and it's because it's, it's a different quality of the information in the food. And so most of the studies on meat are really done on large populations. They're what we call observational studies. They don't prove cause and effect. They look for correlations. And, you know, when you looked at the studies on, on meat, the, the big studies that were done with, you know, a million people, half a million people, you know, this was done in the era, one, when meat was considered bad to eat. You know, it was, we were told, don't eat meat. It's got saturated fat. It's bad for you. So people who are health conscious didn't eat it. That's called the healthy user effect, meaning, you know, People aren't doing bad stuff to themselves, so it's not the meat that's the problem. It's that they're not smoking, they're not drinking alcohol, they're not they're 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 exercising, they're eating whole foods, and that's why they don't have less heart disease. It may not be the fact that they're not eating meat. And on the other hand, when you look at the people who did eat meat in those studies, they had really bad habits. They didn't care about their health, so they were far more overweight. They ate 800 calories more a day. They smoked more. They drank more. They ate less fruits and vegetables. They ate more processed food and junk food. So, you know, of course they had more disease. And the one study that I love was when they looked at two groups of people, meat eaters and vegetarians who shopped at health food stores, their death rate went down in half for both groups because they were eating meat in the context of a whole foods diet. Now, meat shouldn't be the staple in your diet, but it should be a side dish in the, in the face of a lot of good quality plant foods that help you to deal with uh, the need you have for phytochemicals. So, uh, so what do you think about the carnivore diet? Well, I think it's problematic. I mean, a lot of people are trying it and I think people get rid of all the bad stuff in their diet and that can often help. So if you go from eating a traditional American diet with processed food, 60% starch and sugar and processed calories to eating only meat, you're cutting out all the gluten and the dairy and the sugar and the processed food. So that's going to make you feel better. Over a long period of time, I think there, it could be problematic because it's, it's devoid of certain phytochemicals and nutrients and, and, it, and, and it, is, it can affect the microbiome in ways that I don't think are that healthy. So, you know, we are not, you know, lions. <laughs> you know, we, are, we are humans and, and have evolved on an omnivore diet. So I, I think I believe that, that phytochemicals are really important for human health, and, and I don't see how you get those just on a carnivore diet. Although it has helped people with autoimmune disease, like I said, because you're cutting other stuff out. Yeah, you know, I have, I have no problem with it uh, as a, the ultimate elimination diet. Uh, in fact, some people have actually accused me of being the father of the carnivore diet because you're eliminating lectins out of your diet. Yeah. So, no, I, I yeah. don't want to uh, be the father of the carnivore diet. But anyhow, uh, so what about fish and poultry? Same rules apply? Well, in every, in every area, in every category of food, I think the key is to focus on quality and, and understand the source of what you're doing. So if you're eating, for example, fish, you know, a lot of fish we have now is contaminated with mercury, microplastics, 
Uh, and it's challenging. And there's farm-raised fish, but there's problems with those. So there are sort of organically sustainably raised farm fish, and, and you can source those. And there's a great resource called cleanfish.com where you can go and look at what those fish might be. Uh, the second, and there's and there's great sources, for example, like uh, Vital Choice Seafood and other companies that, that provide uh, you know well sourced uh, seafood. The second is um, poultry. You know, poultry is a mess because <laughs> you know we have so many names. There's organic. There's grass fed. I mean, there's uh, pasture raised. There's cage free. There's free range. There's whatever, and it's all a bunch of uh, nonsense. The key is is you want animals that are, are truly pasture raised, that have been out in pasture, that aren't in cages, that run around, that eat all the, the grubs and the worms and the whatever stuff they find around a farm. Those are the ones you want to eat because they have uh, less um, less of the bad stuff, more of the good stuff. They're not grain fed, which is their omega-6 levels are lower. They have you know more nutrient density. If you take a chicken and look at the eggs from a chicken that's running around in the wild, like eating pasture, it's like the eggs are like, dark dark yellow if you look at one of those you know factory farm eggs it's like a pale yellow color i mean it's almost like a bright orange sunset if you look at the uh, the real eggs that are like that so i, I think we want to always focus on quality i think pasture raised is ideal for eggs and and poultry and and of course uh, organic is sort of the next best but even that may be problematic so i think we have to just do our best to find the best quality and not be fanatical about it but understand that you know, it's a hierarchy of needs. Getting off a of processed food is key, and eating more plant foods is key. And the rest just sort of kind of can look at the fine print of how do we how do we navigate? What is the best source of fish? What is the best source of meat? What is the best source of poultry? And I go through all that in the Pegan Diet and explain that very in great detail. Now I know you're down on dairy in general, but you do like grass fed butter. Uh, how come? Well, I, I think uh, ghee is my favorite in terms of that. I think, you know, we can tolerate saturated fat for most of us. I think, again, it's another one of those big topics. It's gotten a lot of bad press, but it's actually the science doesn't support it being universally bad for everybody. And I, I think there are some people who respond badly to saturated fats, but it's an individual thing. You have to just check your lipids. But for most of us, a little bit of ghee or grass-fed butter can be fine. And grass-fed butter, while it does still contain some of the casein and whey that's in, in milk, very, very little. And if you don't want that, you can get ghee. But the uh, the, the, the grass-fed butter has higher levels of, uh, of vitamins, and for example, vitamin A and carotenoids, and it's much you know, it's darker yellower. And also, it contains something called CLA, which is a conjugated linolenic acid, which is a powerful anti-cancer compound and metabolism booster, and uh, you don't get that in, in regular butter. Yeah, there's also a nice amount of vitamin K2. And I, I agree with you, if, if people are going to use grass-fed butter and they should be aware of casein A1, and use grass-fed ghee. Uh, that's really the, the best choice. That's what I, that's pretty much what I do, yeah. yeah. All right, now there's a lot you admire about the vegan diet. Um, so what are the shortcomings that you note in the book? Well, you know, it's interesting. I just, I just had a patient uh, which sort of brought it to the forefront for me again, uh, because if you're not really smart about it, if you don't design it very well, um, it can it can be really problematic. And this one patient I saw was a young 26 year old woman who was feeling tired and had a lot of inflammation in her body and lots of pimples and acne. And I mean, she was relatively thin, but you know, just struggling with her well being and health. Uh, and we did you know extensive nutritional testing. She was significantly protein deficient, really depleted in amino acids and protein. She was massively B12 deficient, vitamin D deficient. She was completely devoid of any omega-3 fats. She never ate fish. And these are not, you know, kind of insignificant nutrients. These are significant things that affect the quality of your health in your life and every system in your body. So if you are um, smart about it, you can be accommodating by making sure you're designing your diet in a way that maximizes protein, for example. There's, but you're, you're not going to, I don't think you're going to get it as a vegan unless you jack up protein shakes. So there's a a, a, a shake that uh, I just saw in a health food store over here, which is a Garden of Life sport shake. But it, it, it's very interesting because they jacked up the amino acids that you need for protein synthesis. They jacked up the amount of protein because you need more protein if you have vegan protein. So, you know, where, you know, a four or six ounce piece of a chicken or fish will you know, be equivalent to two or three cups of beans. <laughs> you know, like one, it's hard to eat that many beans, <laughs> and two, you're also getting like a hundred plus grams of carbs in there. I mean, you're getting fiber, you're getting minerals, and you know, there's other issues around lectins. But I think that the the issue is is how do you how do you actually get um, the right the right amount of 
of, of high quality nutrients, protein, zinc, uh, iron, vitamin D, B12, omega-3 fats. These are the common deficiencies we see in vegans. Uh, so you either have to take supplements with it or you have to really sort of design your diet. And the other thing is that, you know, people uh, should not be focused on dogma. And that's the whole point of the book. The dogma gets people into trouble. Now, I'm going to be a vegan because I believe in it and it's good for me and it's good for the planet. Well, one, it may not be good for you. If your health declines and you feel depleted and you're, and you're a woman and your menstrual cycle stops, you have infertility, or your libido goes down or you're tired or you have all these other issues, you, you may not be the right diet for you. Where somebody else might thrive in it. a guy like Rich Roll can run an Ironman triathlon and vegan diet, he's great. You know, like, but that doesn't mean it's good for everybody. In the same way, be eating meat is not great for everybody, and it makes them feel bad and and has adverse consequences. So I think we have to really get you know, off the dogmas, and that was really the purpose of the title, which is kind of a joke. You know, the vegan diet, it's kind of poking fun at the at these diet extremes. You know. Uh that, that brings up a good point. Uh, like in my paradox books, uh, I have a food pyramid and you have a food pyramid in this book. Can you talk about what that looks like? How do, how do you build your food pyramid? Well, it's pretty simple. You know, the bottom of it should be predominantly plants. I mean, I, we should be eating plant, a plant we call plant forward or plant rich diet. I don't, I don't think the term plant based is, is, uh, is the best for most people because it means it's only plants. But, uh, and I think there, there are needs for certain nutrients that we're only really getting from, from animal foods. Um, but the, the, the idea is to eat a lot of plants. It's, it's, you know, and then second would be you know, getting a lot of your you know, protein and fat from, from good quality foods. So it would be nuts and seeds. It would be good oils like olive oil. It would be avocados. It would be you know, nuts like macadamia nuts, which I love, are sort of like the olive oil of nuts. And then, and then of course, uh, you know, high quality protein, chicken, fish, meat, lamb, whatever, then it's sourced properly. Uh, and, and then so we move up the pyramid and sort of include a little more, uh, things like nuts and seeds and, 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 and grains and beans, but in a very specific way, I'm very careful about which grains and which beans you want to be eating. I don't think we should all be eating gluten because even if you're healthy, it does cause a leaky gut, even microscopically. So even if you don't have gluten sensitivity or celiac, it's still causing a little havoc down there. Uh, and, and there are maybe grains that are great like that. There's a new discovery of a grain called Himalayan tartary buckwheat, which is actually a very ancient grain that was uh, sort of been rediscovered and is grown by a friend of ours, Jeff Bland, up in upstate New York, and they just got the first batch. I got my I flour here. I'm going to make my buckwheat pancakes. But they, they are probably the most powerful phytonutrient rich superfood on the planet with over 150 phytochemicals, some of which are found in other plants. It's got you know, probably two or three times the protein content of most other grains. It's got the special fibers that are incredibly good for the microbiome. So that's a very different thing than eating some dwarf wheat that's sprayed with glyphosate, that's preserved with calcium propionate, that has extra glide molecules that are more likely to trigger autoimmunity and are, have an amyloid Pectin, amyl, I'm sorry, amylopectin A, which is a super starch that's worse than sugar. So, like, that's a very different grain. If I make my pancakes from one or the other, I have very different effects on my body. So, it's really about which which of these things we should be eating. And then, of course, at the top, there's like recreational things, like a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of sugar, but very like limited. Can you have it every day? I mean, could you have a square chocolate every day if you're metabolically healthy? Yeah. If I, you know, ride my bike. 20 miles and I work out for half an hour with my trainer and I, you know, like eat healthy and yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about a little bit of, of, you know, chocolate or some sugar. I think it's the amount we're eating. You know, I always say sugar is a recreational drug. It's like tequila. I love it, but I wouldn't have it every night. <laughs> and, you know, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which is basically what we're doing in America. We, we eat sugar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, either in the form of flour or, or sh directly sugar. No, you're right. So what was one, I, I love to ask this, what was the most interesting or surprising thing you learned uh, researching and writing the Pegan diet? Well, it really has to do with um, this idea that, that when we eat well for us, it's also connected to how we grow the food. So there's a chapter in there called the how to be uh, a regenitarian, how to eat like a regenitarian. And what that means is how do you eat in a way that regenerates human health and regenerates the soil health and the health of the ecosystems on the farms. 
And it turns out they're intimately connected. You know, you talk a lot about the microbiome, but there's a microbiome in the soil, which we've destroyed through glyphosate and through over tillage and through lack of cover crops and crop rotations and monocrop fields. And that's destroyed the soil, which has led to food that is highly nutrient depleted because there's no nutrients in the soil. And it's led to a set of farming practices that really destroys the climate, the environment, our water resources. I mean, we literally, uh, if you put end to end our food system, it's the number one cause of climate change. You know, we've lost a third of our topsoil by tillage and everything else, which, which has actually put all this carbon in the atmosphere. So a third of all the carbon right now in the atmosphere, not from fossil fuels, it's from loss of carbon in the soil. <laughs> And that we can actually regenerate all that soil and we can use less chemicals or no chemicals, limit our water resource use because a soil that's got organic matter can hold 27,000 gallons per acre of water. And we need to stop destroying the waterways by the runoff of nitrogen fertilizer, stop, you know, causing all the uh, chemical damage to endocrine systems from the pesticides and herbicides and the glyphosate. I mean, it just could go on and on. So it's kind of a win, win, win where you connect the dots between really where does healthy eating start? It starts on the farm. And how do we regenerate human health and how do we regenerate planetary health and ecosystems and climate change? That's really was sort of shocking to me to really learn how connected those things are. Let's talk about the RDA. So mm -hmm. the current RDA, which is- It's the recommended the, dietary allowance. Correct. Right. And that was based on studies that we know were flawed, right? Those were based on nitrogen-based studies of 18-year-olds that we wanted to, or the they wanted to provide an amount which would stop disease, you know, it's baseline for disease. It's so the, it's the minimum amount amounts. you need so you don't get sick. It's not how much you need to be healthy. Correct. So we came up, or they came up with a number, not me, way before my time, unless my Botox is that good, but not having any lately. Um, the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram, and that spans from anyone ages 18 and beyond. Mm. 18, 50, 60, 80. That is the minimum amount. There are, There is 30 years of data to support that the minimum amount is not adequate. We know that as you age, you need double the RDA. For body composition, you're looking at double the RDA. You mean for building more muscle? For anything. In obesity, we know that the higher your diet is in protein while calories are controlled, the more lean muscle mass you can maintain. And we spoke, when we started talking about this, we talked about why muscle was so important. And this obesity epidemic isn't quite an obesity epidemic. It is really an epidemic of poor muscle mass, low mm, muscle mass, mm. obesogenic sarcopenia, loss and destruction of tissue. We are largely domesticated. So what's happened is we have- Wait, what do you mean we're largely <laughs> domesticated? We ride in cars. Oh. We're not doing physical movement. We are eating in a way that is- not supporting our current existence. Mm. Um, and actually red meat consumption has gone down by 29% since 1975. But chicken's gone up. Chicken has gone up. Dairy has gone down. Yeah. The concept that we are eating too much protein, the average American eats between 60 and 90 grams. Women are around maybe a little bit above 60 grams and men are around 90 grams. So that's the average American. Heart disease, Alzheimer's, heart, you know, uh, obesity, hypertension, all of these comorbidities and diseases are on the, on the rise. Yeah. Protein is not the problem. Protein's never been the problem. Mm. Protein is the defining nutrient for a high quality diet. So you've been studying protein science in a way that I don't think many people have. Uh, and you say there's 30 years of research that kind of contradicts a lot of the perspectives that people have. It does. And shows the importance of protein for longevity, for health, yeah. for preventing disease. And yet, at the same time, we're hearing that if we eat meat, it's gonna kill us. That there's this huge sort of media push around eat less meat, eat less meat for health, eat less meat to save the planet, it's a problem. So how do you reconcile those two things? And you mentioned, you know, that there are extreme groups that are pushing this, but it's not just extreme groups. There was a major report in Eat Lancet uh, in Lancet uh, about uh, the need to actually reduce our global meat consumption, that there isn't enough 
land and agriculture to support this for growing population of the world. And I, in my mind, I, I also believe that we do need the right kinds of protein in the right ways, uh, but it's hard for me to sort of reconcile these two things. So how, how do you explain that? I'm really glad you brought that up. Now, the 30 years of research clearly isn't my own. I'm not that old. I have been, though, trained by some of the best people. And one of them in particular, my mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman, who is a professor emeritus at University of Illinois, has published multiple studies and is certainly one of the world leading experts. And we have these discussions over coffee all the time. Mm. And you do bring up a very good point, especially when it comes to greenhouse gas and sustainability. Let's look at the U.S. The U.S., and this is from the, the EPA. Some, some of this data is from the EPA. The U.S. contributes 15% to greenhouse gas. 15%. From Out animals. of the entire world, right? That we contribute 15%. Total from everything. From everything. Mm. That includes transportation, agriculture, mm. land waste, all of that. Mm. Our contribution in the United States is 15%. Mm. Out of that 15%, 9% is agriculture. Mm. I'm going somewhere with this. So out of the entire world, we are 15%. Out of that 15%, 9% is agriculture. Out of that 9%, 5%, around 5%, 4.6% is fruits and vegetables. What it's taking to grow and decompose and, and that 4 point, around 5%. Cattle and dairy, 3.6%. Out of all of the- And that's feedlot stuff. That's, that's not- No, no, that's everything. That's not regenerative ag. It is, it's everything. The greenhouse gas, so for greenhouse gas, all of cattle, all of dairy contributes 3.6%. So if you were to say go meatless Monday, mm. and let's say we were gonna cut that in half, it's, you still have to have some protein, you can't become protein deficient. So let's say we reduce, kill all, you know, we eliminate all the cows and we're now at 3.6%, we cut that in half, what is that, 1.3%? That's in America, though. That's in America. Globally, there's a lot of meat being grown. So, I mean, yes, and we should discuss that. But I can tell you in America that if you also look at that 9% of agriculture, you have a component that comes from waste and a component that comes from overfeeding. So we are in an obese, obesogenic environment. 10% is of this contributing factor to greenhouse gas is waste and overeating. So overeating is one part. Food waste. We food waste 40% of so, our food, right? So we're wasting and we contribute. So out of that number, that 9%, we're contributing one third of that, just that 9%. One third is food waste. Another 10% is overeating. Mm -hmm. So while the discussion is, is somehow targeted on cattle, which make cattle and dairy, which make up 3.6%, that is not the big target for our 15%. We have electricity, mm. transportation. Transportation, I think, 29%. Uh, um, electricity, another 30%. So all of everything outside of that 9% is, is largely controllable by us. Mm -hmm. When you look at the number, and this is not for the world, but this is for the US. If we wiped out all of the United States and all of the cattle and everything, our contribution to sustainability climate change is 15%. That is very small. Yeah. Well, it's significant, but it's, yeah. In the whole scheme of everything, it is. But, global, but globally, it, it said, that, you know, our, our agricultural system as a whole is responsible for a third to half of all greenhouse gas emissions. Our making. global system, the, the world, you mean? The world, yeah. But and that, and, and, that, and that includes everything. And 50% of that is natural. So we have wetlands and termites and rainforests and things that 50% of all greenhouse gas is naturally produced. Mm -hmm. Climate change is certainly happening. However, 
there is a, a natural aspect to some of these things. We live on a green planet. If we didn't, we'd be in Mars. Mm. Greenhouse gas is, you know, it's kind of like that all or nothing thinking that this, this concept of turnover and um, natural ecological processes are all bad. That's not necessarily true. I mean, we are certainly contributing 49% so, of the- So what you're saying is pretty radical. You're saying that our meat production and animal production is not a big contributor. To no. Even though a lot of data seems to contradict that. But what data? If you look at the, the EPA and, and if you really look at the contributing factors, Donna Lehman wrote a great paper on sustainability less than a year ago about this topic. If you really tease out all the numbers- just like the whole protein controversy, it's it doesn't hold up. Mm. A lot of the discussion about how protein causes cancer, how protein is bad for you, it's all epidemiological based data. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So, so the first issue is, is it a big factor in climate change? What about feedlot versus regenerative ag? Because it's not just the feedlots, it's all the corn, the soy grow, the rainforest we cut down, the soil that's erosion. True. All that's true. All that all is that a is big, true. huge issue. So it's not just the cows themselves, it's what we do to grow the cows. It, all of that and, is absolutely and true. And regenerative ag arguably will draw down carbon, which means graze, graze, grazing cattle, but you can't grow as many cattle on graze land, grazing and, and rangelands as you can in feedlots. So the volume of meat that we need to produce to have you know, 90 grams or 12 ounces per person per day globally is a lot of meat. And, and even if it was the healthy thing on the planet, how is that sustainable? I think it's a great question, and I certainly don't have the answer. I think we should control what we can control mm. and see if we can't regulate those things otherwise, really decrease our transportation, eat locally, stop shipping our foods, which all of these things are having a great impact on greenhouse gas and climate change and, and impacting the globe. Why not do that first rather than sacrifice our health? We know excess calories are bad. We know excess carbohydrates are bad. We know this drives insulin. We know insulin drives cancer. Yeah. So you have these really big glaring things that can be fixed. Yeah. Why go right for meat? Why don't we clean up our end? Like, let's eat local. We don't need to be getting avocados from Mexico. That's true. I, I don't need to have kiwis from New Zealand. I'm going to eat local. I'm not going to... Um, maybe fly as much or I'll use pl public transportation. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing with cows is we use their leather and all kinds of other things. Yeah. So we're not just talking about meat. In addition, if we want to talk about cattle, cattle are upcyclers. They're upcyclers of food. So for every one gram of poor quality protein, for every, I'm sorry, um, it's, point, it's for every 0.6 grams of poor quality protein, which we know with the deficient in amino acids, plants, those kinds of things, they make one gram of high quality protein. So why not, again, I mean, I feel very passionately about this yeah. because we are completely misled. Yeah. So we should take care of the fundamental things that we can handle while maintaining our health. And probably ultimately the health is going to be a blend of plant and animal. Yeah. But rather than just attack this one small yeah. area, let's do the things that we know. Stop overeating mm -hmm. and stop wasting your food yeah. and stop traveling and stop eating stuff from a different country when you live in Manhattan. Yeah, that's true. So that brings up the other issue, and you sort of mentioned it in what you just said, which is quality of protein. Not all proteins created equal. Yeah. Yet, you know, the argument that is being made is that we should eat more plant-based proteins. We should eat more rice and beans. And what's wrong with that as a way of getting your protein? That's a great question. Well, if you're 20, you could probably manage that. But with rice and beans comes carbohydrates and excess calories. Let's just take quinoa. And actually, remember I was up at Lennox a couple years ago and I, I did a talk about the protein perspective for yeah. the crew and I, and I had a chart that broke down what plants you would have to eat to match a chicken breast. Okay, let's get into okay, it. Okay, so for one chicken breast, one small chicken breast, maybe four ounces, you would need about six cups of quinoa mm -hmm. to equal that about amino acid profile mm -hmm. plant protein and animal protein are not created equal it would be wonderful if people wanted to eat plants and could sustain a healthy metabolism if you are so you've got one chicken breast that's 150 grams and now you've eaten quinoa six cups or so which is a lot maybe four to six cups now you've eaten 600 calories to try to get that amino acid profile at one time 
Mm. It's not that that clearly is not sustainable. Mm. Rice and beans, that is not a sustainable way for a population that is aging. And when I say aging, I mean anyone over the age of 20. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's a movie coming out called Game Changers. You might have heard about it by James Cameron, where he documents the power of vegan diets for athletic performance and shows world-class Olympic athletes being vegans and actually having massive muscle amounts. Do you, and do you know, there? that's a great point. You know why that is, why that can happen? Muscle is stimulated two ways. Number one, resistance exercise or exercise. Yeah. And number two, dietary protein. If you grossly reduce one of those things, which in that crew was dietary protein, their exercise balance sets out, balances that out. So you can be a vegan as long as you hit the gym five days a week for an hour. At least, <laughs> like a crazy person. Yeah. You know, and then we also have to think about, there, you know, there, there is a percentage of the population that can do well being vegan. But the NHANES data, which is a huge data set, that's the best that we have, it's a survey data, shows that actually vegans and vegetarians are one half of 1%. Mm -hmm. Of the population. Of the population. So this is a very small group of people that can maintain and do well. Plant protein and animal protein are totally different. They have different levels of amino acids. Animal protein has the building blocks required for muscle tissue, not to mention bioavailable zinc, B12. So you say also that leucine, you talk about leucine as one of the key amino acids uh -huh. that is needed to produce muscle. It's sort of the rate limiting amino acid, meaning if you don't have enough of that, you can't make. Well, you stimulate that pathway, the protein kinase pathway, which is mTOR. And there's been a lot of talk, a lot of discussion around mTOR about how this is a cancer, this is a, a key component in cancer, and that's why you shouldn't eat protein because you're going to stimulate mTOR. Right. Well, mTOR is also stimulated by exercise. It's also stimulated in all other tissues, pancreas, heart, all these other tissues, largely by insulin. Carbohydrates are the problem, not protein. Mm. mTOR signaling, which is a, it, it allows our body to nutrient sense, mm. has been maintained since the beginning of time. Growth is not a bad thing. Growing bigger, growing stronger, growing bone, growing muscle. Growth is not a problem. Mm. And when you think about cancer, cancer is a disease of the genome. Yeah. Right? And it is an inability to then begin to repair and regulate. There is not something that is actually, protein is not causing the cancer. Now, if you have cancer, certainly you push that mTOR pathway. That can be a bad thing. And that's perhaps where a ketogenic diet comes in. Mm. But the concept that, upregulating a pathway which has been beneficial throughout creation is completely erroneous. Let's talk about risk ratios, relative risk. Can, can I just throw that yeah. out there? Well, this is, yeah, this is part of the story around, you know, meat because it seems like every week there's a new study that comes out that says meat's going to kill you. If you eat more meat, it's going to be a problem. There was one just last week. Uh -huh. You know, how do we interpret those as scientists, lay people, eaters? So hard, so hard. I will tell you that um, really finding good scientists that you trust are key. There was a big paper that came out that linked IGF uh, to animal protein and, um, you know, aging, all of this stuff. Uh -huh. And there- was, IGF is a growth right. factor that comes from often eating carbs and sugar, yes. also stimulated by protein, that actually has been linked to cancer and other things. Right. So this article in Cell came out and it really talked about how people should have 30 to 40 grams of protein a day, which is a protein deficiency essentially. It's now below the RDA. The leading scientists in the world wrote a letter to the editor that went through all the flaws of the paper and how it was hand-selected mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. how it was very unethical, and it, they had statisticians, and it was signed by the top world-leading experts who have dedicated their life to studying this. Mm. who are not agenda driven they are not funded by meat they're not funded by these uh, boards but they really truly care national cattlemen's association never got published <laughs> it never got published because one of the one of the researchers was an editor of the journal mm. 
And I, I've posted that on my website. It's available, this letter to the so it's editor. It's like censorship, scientific censorship. It's exactly like scientific censorship. So it becomes very difficult to get the- to counter the argument. To counter the argument. And listen, everybody wants to talk about protein or they want to talk about cancer and IGF. So why are those studies not true then? If, if all these studies come out that show the But they're not come. all the studies. They, if Then if you go and you look back at the research, it doesn't hold up. So yeah. now you have the mouse with the microphone so why doesn't it hold up? So let, let's talk like, about risk wrong? ratio. Let's yeah. talk about relative risk. Relative risk is what is your risk of doing this thing and getting this disease? And it is a standard of. So if you eat eggs, what's your risk of getting yeah. heart disease? Right? So you, this is the standard of uh, looking at good data. Mm. When you look at the relative risk of smoking and cancer, that's 12. Or 20. <laughs> <laughs> right. In order for something to be considered a risk. It needs to be above two. Yeah. And this is something that has been in the scientific literature for since it's been around. So in other words, if a study comes out and the ratio or the, the risk, risk ratio is, is less, is than, less two, than two, it is a, which which in other words you could say is two hundred percent increase, right? Then it's kind of meaningless. It's meaningless. So and the, right. So then if you go, so now we know that cancer and smoking is a twelve. And by the way. When we talk about cancer, you know, there's lung cancer, number one, and that the, the mortality hasn't changed. We haven't been able to really do much in that area in mm -hmm. the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other cancers. You've got prostate, breast, colon, which are all have links to obesity, right? Um, and that is very clear if you look at the cancer, you know, National Cancer Association, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. any of these journals. Anyway, so if you go back, so when we say cancer blanketly, I mean, we really have to be, what are we talking about? So we go back to the risk ratio. The risk ratio over and over and over again of protein and cancer, guess what it is? 0.1. 1. 1.1 1. 1 yeah. to maybe 1.3. Yeah. This is the data. There has never been anything that has ever come out to show that the risk ratio is higher than that. So in other words, instead of 12, it's 0. 0.12 it's, or 0. It's 1.1. 1. 1. Has to be two to be significant. Yeah. That is where... People have to understand there can be. So when a they say your risk goes up by thirty percent, what that means is it goes from, you know, from one yes. to one point three, not twelve. No, it's still it's not relevant. Right. So it becomes a talking point. The media says meat kills. Right. But it's actually totally not erroneous. even relevant. It's irrelevant. So you have these small studies that are handpicked, NHANES data, epidemiologic, which we know is poor at best. So it never proves anything, by the way, just for people who aren't familiar with science, there's two kinds of main studies. One is an experiment where you take 10,000 people and you feed them steak every day for 20 years. Right. And the other group, you feed them rice and beans for 20 years and you see what happens. That study is never going to happen. Never going to happen. It's billions and millions of dollars. It's too difficult to implement. People eat whatever they want. So they look at big populations. Mm -hmm. They follow these people for 20 years. Every maybe five or six, 10 years, they give them a food questionnaire and say, what did right. you eat last week? Right. And then they try to correlate it with different outcomes. And they try to control for variables, but it's very difficult they to do can. that. They and can. and then that means that when you look at these questionnaires, first of all, these have been invalidated by a lot yeah. of science, that they're not really accurate, that people over-report good stuff, they under-report bad stuff, depending on what the meme of the day is if meat is bad, then people aren't going to say they eat as much. Or maybe if they're healthy, they may not eat as much. So if they're healthy users, it's this effect where if you're conscious about your health and you exercise and you eat great and you don't smoke and you hear that meat's bad for you, you're going to avoid meat because you right. don't want to get sick, even if that's not true. So it looks like they let eat less meat and they get less heart disease or cancer. But it's actually not because of that. It's a, it's a, it's and it a, doesn't. And like you said, it, it doesn't account for other things like total caloric intake, it doesn't account for obesity, smoking, drug intake, drinking. Yeah, they try to control these factors, but one of the biggest studies on meat that I reviewed in my book, uh, Eat Fat, Get Thin, and Food, What the Heck Should I Eat, was the NIH ARP study, which is National Institute of Health, and um, uh, what is it, the, the ARP, the elderly thing, which I try to avoid when I get there, <laughs> throw it in the garbage when I get there, thanks for me, because I'm he over 50. <laughs> They, they said it was half a million people, and they found that there was a significant increased risk of all these diseases, cancer, heart disease, and everything, with people who ate more meat. But when you actually looked at these people in the studies, the ones who ate more meat 
ate 800 more calories a day, were more overweight, smoked more, drank more, didn't exercise, ate less fruits and vegetables, more sugar, processed food, didn't take their vitamins. Of course, they had more disease. It wasn't because of the meat. It was because of all this other stuff. So I think that you are highlighting something that is so essential to understand. Mm. Things are not that confusing. Mm -hmm. It's again, it is small groups with a lot of funding and a lot of money that is agenda driven. Mm. Do we probably need to consume high quality protein while doing it responsibly? Yes. Do I know what the answer is? I don't think anyone knows what that answer is. But again, rather than attacking the high quality protein source that we have, because ultimately that is at first going to affect those with lower income. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's going to be the first people that that affects. The people that maybe can't afford grass fed or mm -hmm. eating high meat. And they're already, we know that lower socioeconomic status, you're also dealing with comorbidities, right. obesity. So focusing on this cattle protein argument as something del you know, deleterious to health is absolutely incorrect. We know the protage study came out and we know that that, that requires protage study was a group was a study that had all the world leading experts come together and do a position paper. Yeah. Saying that as you age, protein intake is clearly the needs are clearly higher. A minimum of 30 grams per meal. You know, really you're looking at 30 to 50 grams per meal, which is four to six ounces yeah, of per meal. And it has to be animal protein. Well, if you can now, this is uh, a, another important point, is you can use lower quality protein, but you have to augment with branched chain amino acids. So that you, is, in other that words, is a so, possibility. So you can easily be a vegan, but you have to take high leucine protein Well, you want to take supplements. All, the whole branch chain. So it's leucine, isoleucine, and valine. You want to take that together because the, the way in which the system works is it's not giving... One, I mean, they usually work together. It's it's part mm -hmm. of the branch chains. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to give one and, and push the system uh, away and deplete the others. Yeah. If you are vegan and vegetarian, vegan or vegetarian, or having a lower protein meal, let's say a fish that is 15 grams of protein, add in five grams of branched chain amino acids. That is certainly a solution mm -hmm. to not wanting to eat a higher protein diet. Mm -hmm. But please understand that the RDA is the minimum and it will not protect it won't protect my dad it's not going to protect my mom i mean typically when you think about what a better recommendation is mm. for protein it's what is your ideal body weight what is your ideal body weight mark well what i have now perfect what is that <laughs> 185 your protein intake should be 185 grams around 185 grams divided throughout the day Wow. And obviously, you could go less. That's a lot. It's a, well, is it or is it an optimal protein diet? So that means I got to eat, oh, wow, a pound or more of meat a day. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see how you felt. Maybe we could at least, you could probably get to 150 and still be great. Mm. But if you're eating 90, you're too low. Mm. Protein need is based on muscle mass, it's not based on sex, it's based on muscle mass and age. Mm -hmm. And there's no danger to it. Of cancer, kidneys, all this stuff we hear Show about. Show me. No one has ever shown that to be true. When they well, talk about heart disease and protein and red meat, it is not accounted for. It's saturated, it's, it's saturated fats. It's, they've never, you know, it's epidemiological data based on saturated fats. When there was a recent article that came out that showed... Um, uh, high fiber and protein. And when calories were accounted for, there was no difference. I remember being in medical school, and this was, you know, 30 plus years ago, we were told, you know, be careful, don't overuse antibiotics. This is a big issue. Uh, and it's even kind of worse now. <laughs> so, how is this one of the most important public health threats we face today? Well, one of the things I love about you, Dr. Mark, is we share the same passion of regenerative agriculture. In fact, I, I own about five, I co-own 5,000 acres of organic land, uh, some in Tennessee, some in Missouri, where we've, we, we've, we do something myself and uh, Jordan Rubin, it's called permaculture, uh, f creating food for us, but really working on healing the planet. It's incredible. I mean, if you, if we would not be focused on 
the short term, but focused on the long term, even financially, we could feed the entire world. If we focused on, you know, uh, doing food for us where we're growing more things like apple trees and walnut trees and more perennial plants rather than soybeans, wheat and corn, like uh, it, it literally changes the environment. And so all that being said, I think it's so, so important just to note one, you know, it's better for the planet when you follow these farming practices. But what we're doing today is we're giving a lot of these animals, uh, you know, we're giving them, we're feeding them genetically modified corn, soy and wheat. That's the, that's the base of their feed. And then we're putting antibiotics in there uh, just consistently. And what happens is 80% of the world's antibiotics are not given to humans, they're given to livestock. 80% yeah. of antibiotics, it's crazy. So what's gonna be happening is when we consume those antibiotics via those uh, animal tissues or dairy or other things, what, what that's going to do is that's going to damage a lot of our gut microbes, okay? It's gonna, it's gonna kill off a lot of those good bacteria. You're gonna have more overgrowth of a lot of the bad bacteria. And that's a massive part of your immune system. This is a big, uh, you know, big cause of things like leaky gut syndrome, which is the root cause of autoimmune disease weakened immunity, migraine headaches, food sensitivities. And one of the things I do talk about in my book, Eat Dirt, I really get into, you know, how we have sometimes over sanitized in many cases. And I think that's important, even in the world of COVID today, it's important to keep in mind, we want to, we want to practice proper sanitation. We absolutely do. And I think there are some natural things that can help us do it. There are really uh, powerful essential oils like tea tree oil and others that I think are good to use on a regular basis. But studies show we need to be deeply connected with the earth. You know, um, and so with that being said, there are studies showing if you live on a farm, you actually have a stronger immune system, a healthier immune system, less food allergies, less food sensitivities. And they've shown in studies, if you have a dog or a cat, actually by 49, you have 49% less food allergies, food sensitivities, uh, food sensitivities and a stronger immune system. What else is unique is I read a study, this is out of Japan, and they showed that if you're eating foods that are more local in nature, they talked about seaweed over there, that you're getting different types of soil-based organisms, whether it's from the sea or the land, and those actually work with your immune system at driving out bad bacteria, helping modulate your immune system. You know, when we hear of immunization, organization, Dr. Dr. Mark, a lot of times people first, their head goes to a shot, but the truth is like, I've got an eight and a half month old daughter now, and we will support her immunity. We will support her naturally, uh, you know, naturally immunize her through, uh, getting her exposures to certain things. In fact, local honey, you know, a lot of times people talk about, Oh, take local honey for allergies. The big benefit of local raw honey is that it contains over 200 microbes. And if you do that year round, you're getting pollen and all these exposures. It's, it's, it's a form of a natural immunization. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. Obviously there's many, but it's one of the ways we naturally strengthen and boost our immune systems. So I, th I think we've really lost that sort of ancient art of being deeply connected to the outdoors and our environment and, and in that way, strengthening our, our immunity and our bodies. Absolutely. Well, let's let's talk about um, uh, food as medicine and how so much of our chronic illness is caused by the foods we eat and also can be healed by eating different foods. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, I think we know this. And, and if anybody's listening to your podcast, they know this. But obviously, you know, the big culprits are sugar. It's a lot of the refined uh, grains, again, the, the corn and the wheat. Uh, soybeans, it's a bean, but that's in there as well. So getting a lot of carbohydrates from there, the hydrogenated oils, we want to stay away from that stuff. And a lot of the things that contain genetically modified organisms or the or, or animals eating foods that they shouldn't. Okay. So the dairy <laughs> byproducts, the, the, the meat products, you know, we use that principle, right? You are what you eat, what they ate. Okay. So if they're eating a lot of grains, their, their tissues are full of omega-6 fats versus a lot of grass, omega, more omega-3s, you're going to have more balance or that's going to help your body heal. But one of the unique things that ancient practitioners recommended, Dr. Mark, and I think this is fascinating and it's absolutely true is when you in order, like knowing what foods to eat based on your sick, here's what the ancient physicians recommended. They said, okay, what the food looks like. If the food looks like a, a body part, it supports that. What is the food's flavor? 
as well. And what's the food's color? And they would look at those three things and say, that's how you know what to eat. So for instance, a walnut looks like your brain. In fact, you crack it open, it has two hemispheres. We know today that walnuts are loaded with, loaded with choline and vitamin E and some omega-3 fats, so they're good for the brain. A coconut as well looks like your head. Coconut has all these you know, medium chain triglycerides, which are good for your brain. And actually a water inside that almost looks like cerebral spinal fluid that's actually good for your body's fluid and systems. We've got beets that actually look like, uh, you know, look like blood uh, when, when you are, uh, you know, when you're cutting them and yeah. they have known to increase nitric oxide in the body and improve your cardiovascular health. Celery looks like your bones. Celery is probably the most alkaline vegetable. And so it actually supports your bones and especially supporting vitamin K and calcium levels. And then, and I could keep going on a few others. This is so fascinating. Yeah, reishi mushrooms look identical to your kidneys and adrenal glands. So do kidney beans. You know, onions are amazing for your cells. Those are loaded with quercetin and things that actually support mitochondrial function, all kinds of things. So, you know, one of the things I, I go through that in the whole book, I have these, you know, big pictures and graphs going through. Here's all of those foods. So we know that. And then flavors, five flavors support five different, what they considered organ systems mm -hmm. that work together. So sour foods really activate and support liver detoxification. Bitter really affects the heart and the blood. You've got a umami, which affects the lungs and colon. You've got sweet, which is more the pancreas and stomach, the upper GI. And then you've got salty, which is your kidneys and your adrenals. And then certain foods like green is very good for liver, gallbladder. But anyways, that's how the ancients knew. And I really believe that God created you know, food, you know, our, our, our food here, I don't think he made it real complicated. Like, Hey, I'm going to make it really hard for them to figure out what to eat. I think some of the stuff, I'm not saying everything is simple, but I think some of the times using food as medicine, isn't really complex. If we are, you know, able to, to start thinking and learning about some of these things. Yeah, it's true. You know, when you, I love your, your sort of title of your book, ancient nutritional, because, you know, I, I've often thought about, you know, how is it that, uh, you know, we're eating such a mono diet, you know, our, our diet is mostly three crops, 60% of our diet is three crops, wheat, uh, corn and rice around the world. Uh, another maybe nine or 10 crops make up the rest of it. Uh, yeah. We used to eat 800 species of plants and, and agriculture, you could argue, uh, was one of the most destructive things to be discovered or invented. Uh, mm -hmm. because it led to, you know, you know, we used to be about average height of five, nine as hunter gatherers. And then when we started agriculture, it went down to five, three for men. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Because they were so malnourished. They were starting to eat single crops. They were only eating rice or they were only eating whatever they could grow. And they weren't have this massive diversity of plants and animals and bugs and whatever that they ate back then. Uh, and, and we've, we've, we've dumbed down our diet to these uh, very few ingredients. It's led to these massive nutritional deficiencies. I mean, you just listed, you know, some of the common foods, some of them are, are less common, you know, like ratio mushrooms and so forth. But, you know, I'm here in Hawaii and, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty well-traveled, well-educated guy. And I go to the farmer's market here and I'm like, what is that? And what is that? And yeah. how, what's a Suriname cherry? And what's a, I don't even know what these things are. I'm, I'm eating things I never even saw yeah. before. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, we are, we are so deprived of all the medicines in food and that we've evolved actually to use these compounds with our biology to regulate different functions of our system, which you sort of were mentioning. And, and we've lost that understanding. It's not just about calories. It's not just about taste or flavor. And what's really amazing, I don't know if you actually know this book, Josh, uh, it's called Nourishment by a guy named Fred Provenza. And you, mm. you should listen to that podcast that I had okay. called it is Meat Medicine with this guy. He's this old guy with big beard. He's like this, uh, he sort of, sort of looks like a mad scientist who's a rangeland scientist. But he talks about how animals seek out different flavors of, of different plants and have different properties that are used as medicines and that, wow. that have nutrient density. So, but when, when animals are left to their own, they, they forage on all these incredible variety of plants that, that provides all these incredible nutritional needs we need uh, just through their natural intelligence. So what you're talking about is these different flavors, these different tastes, these different colors. They're not just, you know, decoration. They're not just for our personal enjoyment. They're actually designed to heal our bodies and to regulate all the functions of our body, which is just so brilliant. And that's what your book really goes into. I encourage people to go get a copy. It's called Ancient Remedies, Secrets to Healing with Herbs, Essential Oils, CBD, and the Most Powerful Natural Medicine 
in history. <laughs> the most powerful natural medicine in history. What is that? <laughs> well, well, the natural medicine in history, I really go through. Actually, it's more personalized medicine. That's the most powerful medicine in history I yes. get to in the book because, you know, different herbs are good for so many things. You know, I cover stuff in the book, like, for instance, if you've got an immune system issue in ancient Chinese medicine, actually, an herb we, 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 some people use here, but I don't see, I've actually heard you talk about it, but probably one of the top five herbs in Chinese medicine was astragalus. Like astragalus mm -hmm. today, what it's known for is actually helping repair a leaky gut or your gut related immune system. You know, that's super powerful. A lot of people don't even, you haven't even heard of astragalus, but has all of these benefits. We know herbs like uh, galangal, you know, that cousin of turmeric and ginger has all of these anti-cancer properties. Andrographis. There's some great new research on andrographis and its ability to fight viruses. And so anyways, yeah, I think it depends on the person. One of the things I do love, Dr. Mark, about ancient Chinese medicine is it was really the first form uh, that I've seen documented of personalized medicine. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of almost started off and also in includes your personality profile. So if anybody's ever done like an Enneagram test or Myers-Briggs or DISC profile, sometimes when you read those, you're like, wow, that's, you know, almost every time you're like, wow, that is really straight on. That's my personality. Well, they did that in Chinese medicine. It's called the five elements. And so they really know Hey, here's your personality. But they said, based on your emotions, I think this is really incredible. Based on your emotions, that tends to be the biggest driver of what causes disease in which organ system. Because why is it today? Most people would say genetics. Like, why does one person get diabetes, but another person could be eating almost the same diet, but that person ends up with more a uh, heart disease and high blood pressure and cholesterol, another person thyroid issues, and another person, what, what they say is different emotions affect different organs. So for instance, and we know this is true, the emotion of fear, if you're fearful, maybe fear of failure, fear of disappointing loved ones, that actually causes adrenal issues. Or if a child gets really scared at night, nightmares cause fear, that those actually affect the kidneys and they can wet the bed. The emotion of worry specifically affects the upper digestive system, the pancreas and stomach. People say, oh, my stomach feels like it's tied in knots if they worry a lot. The emotion of grief, most affects the lungs and colon, which is your immune system. So, uh, or unforgiveness, something that's happened in the past, a hurt, a trauma, you haven't been able to let it go. That's completely affecting the immune system can trigger things like autoimmune like issues and that sort of thing. Uh, and the thing about heart anxiety, that's related to your heart, your, your blood pressure raises. So they would actually say in Chinese medicine, food is important, but more than 50% of health conditions today are experiencing negative emotion. So they always say, hey, you've got to address that negative emotion to completely heal. Absolutely. I think it's so critical. And I think, you know, your book is just full of practical suggestions and really wonderful tips on how to incorporate some of these ancient principles into everyday life to optimize our health and to sort of fix our biology. I, I sort of want to get into sort of, uh, you know, the, the role of spices and herbs and other things like CBD and essential oils and healing mushrooms around our immune system. Because right now with COVID-19, we're all a little bit scared of getting it. Uh, and what I believe is that, you know, and this is sort of goes back to this ancient debate between Louis Pasteur and another scientist at a time who's mostly been forgotten him, I mean, Claude Bernard. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Louis Pasteur, well, for those who don't know, was the guy who figured out there's microbes and he discovered bacteria and looked under a microscope and saw these things and connected them to pneumonias. For example, strep bacteria causes strep pneumonia and so forth. Uh, Claude Bernard had a different theory. He said, it's not just the microbe, it's the host that matters. He called the, the biological terrain, the state yeah. of your health that determines your risk of getting sick or not and how sick you will get. And I, I think people are not discussing this around COVID, which is just devastating to me because there's so much we can do to rejuvenate our immune system, become immune resilient, and to, and to reduce our risk if we get sick of getting very sick, and even to reduce our risk of getting sick at all. And, and we know from other studies, you can literally inject cold viruses directly into the nostrils of people, and not everybody will get sick. Yeah. It depends. Uh, and one of the studies where they just look at their stress score, the more stress they had, the more likely they were going to get sick. If you weren't stressed, you were less likely to get sick. And that's just one component. Your diet plays a role. And, and what's also really exciting about the, the book that you've written 
ancient remedies is that you include a lot of remedies that can help rejuvenate and build and boost your immune system so we can become more immune resilient and, and actually do better in this, uh, in this pandemic, which I, I fear will be lasting for quite a while, not just another year or so, but much, much longer. Yeah, well, well, Dr. Mark, first off, I love that reference because I've talked about that before, you know, between Pasteur and Bernard and really terrain and the terrain of your body. So first off, I just think that's a perfect example to talk about in terms of COVID and fighting viruses today. You know, really the thought, I want to go back to something Hippocrates said. He said, um, he, he, he said that the body heals itself. He, he really, you know, talked about this, that, listen, it's not a food that heals you. A lot of times we think broccoli heals me or turmeric or another herb. Really, your body, if you get a cut on your hand, your body heals that. Now, your body's going to use these herbals and these foods as the building blocks to repair itself. But what herbs do is they change the environment more than anything. They put your body in a better uh, place where it's better able to heal itself. And so with that, you know, as we're talking about uh, immunity, you know, I think it's really, really important. And, and again, think about this. Also think about your body as a bucket. Okay. If it's clean, if it's healthy, it's not going to, going to attract any bugs. Essentially, that's what some of these things are parasites, viruses, bacteria, you know, yeast, some of these things that we can get inside our body. And think, you know, we had a flood years ago in Nashville. And afterwards, Dr. Mark, I mean, I had so many patients coming in with mold toxicity because they didn't get it cleaned up properly. I mean, mold was a huge issue for years in Nashville. So all that being said, but, but in order for mold to grow, it has to be in a very specific environment. It has to be damp and and the way you get rid of it is you have a lot of airflow and light and you dry it out, okay? The same thing happens in our body. In Chinese medicine, they'd call it dampness. But, but essentially, in our bodies, if our body gets too damp and our body also gets in a bad environment, that's what allows these bugs to thrive. And so you just need to change the environment. That's what these do. One of the things people should notice is that most herbs – that you take for fighting an inf that for fighting a virus are bitter. Okay, mm. bitter drives out dampness and phlegm and candida in Chinese medicine. So, in fact, andrographis, which is one of the herbs now most prescribed in Asia and Japan for something like COVID, it's known as king of the bitters. It is the most bitter. Or have you days that you're like, this is the most bitter thing I've ever had in my life. But if you try echinacea. That's really bitter. That's another yep. good one. And a lot of these yep. olive leaf, these are all very, very bitter. Those herbs are going to help drive out and actually have a lot of those antiviral properties with those things. And then I would also say um, things that are going to just activate the immune system. So you have the ones that help drive the bad stuff out and the ones that strengthen your organ systems in your own body to better fight off the infection. Astragalus is a great example of one that really strengthens your own system so you can better fight off a virus. So what I recommend, Dr. Mark, um, let me talk about nutrients first. Nutrients, number one is vitamin D. I know I've heard you say the same thing, but vitamin D, the most important nutrients we need to support our immunity right now. And number one, get the sun as much as you can, but if not, take vitamin D. Number two, from what I've seen in working with people is zinc. You know, I think even when people are losing their sense of taste and smell, you can go to the medical literature, you can read about it. Most of the time, a lot of times that's, it's more severe, will take longer if you have a zinc deficiency. So that's the next big one. Those are the two biggest ones I've seen, vitamin D, zinc. And then there's other things. I think that vitamin C to a degree can be good, but I don't even think that's the biggest one. I think vitamin A in some cases, or even nutrients like quercetin are, are more important, but I would say zinc and vitamin D, you want to take those. And then in terms of herbals, I really like astragalus for long-term prevention of strengthening your immune system. If you get something, I like andrographis, echinacea, and then to a degree, uh, yeah, those, those are probably the, I mean, I could mention a bunch more, but I think those are the big ones. You have that gut brain connection and it's like a two-way highway and they're, they're basically communicating the the brain's talking to the gut and the gut's talking to the brain. And then you also have the enteric nervous system. Mm. And, and some people sort of forget about the enteric nervous system. And that's the intrinsic nervous system to the gut. So literally, if you, if you sever the, the spinal column and there is no connection to the gut and the brain, the gut still works. You can still, you know, poop. Uh, fine. If you if you sever the spinal, it's got problem. a mind of its own. It's is what you're saying? It's got, a, it's, got a, it's got a mind of its own. Exactly. Right. But you know, Todd, I want to come back to what you said, which is really important. You said, you know, we categorize 
irritable bowel is with constipation or diarrhea or whatever. And there's a whole classification system that that is driven off of symptoms. Yeah. And the difference between functional medicine and conventional medicine thinking about any disease is that it's not focused on the symptoms, it's focused on the causes. So just saying people have irritable bowel doesn't tell you anything about the cause. It tells you they feel uncomfortable, they're bloated, they have diarrhea, their bowels are weird, they're, they're uncomfortable, cramping, whatever the symptoms are. It's irrelevant when it comes to trying to figure out the cause. I mean, yeah, you, you, yeah okay, you have irritable bowel, but that's when you start to think about the problem. In traditional medicine, you name the disease, you stop thinking. Right. You know, and our, our colleague, Sid Baker, always had this great term. He says, you know, f traditional medicine is naming and blaming. You name uh, the disease and then you blame the name for the problem. Oh, I know why your stomach hurts. You have irritable bowel syndrome. No, that's just the name of the problem. Exactly. But, but he talks about thinking and linking, which is functional medicine, right? Yeah. You think about the problem and the cause once you get the diagnosis and you link everything together to see what the factors are. And there's no such thing as irritable bowel syndrome. There's irritable bowel syndromes. Right. Like you said, there's 31 flavors, and and each one is different, and each one needs to be treated differently. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's 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 so 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 true. And, you, and there is this you know this web like uh, interaction in the body, and it's, it's very important to understand uh, the the whole interconnectedness uh, of it. It's very very important. So so typically, you go to the doctor and you have irritable bowel. Um, what do the, what do they tell you to do? Well, you know they they you know they, they'll they'll often tell you you know take some Metamucil and I'll see you later. That's that's, yeah, that's eat more fiber, drink more water. Yeah, that's and, that's, uh, essen that's learn to live with it. And, yeah, that's uh, essentially what they're deal doing. with stress. <laughs> yeah, that deal with stress. Yeah, and, and they'll they'll I, the interesting thing. This is I had a patient just the other day uh, who I was seeing for um, uh, GI symptoms. Um, it wasn't specifically irritable bowel, and the patient's GI doctor said diet has nothing to do with your symptoms. I mean, it was it was unbelievable that a GI doctor told her. Diet makes no difference. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I just, I like. Actually, actually, I was on the, I was on the uh, uh, consult with a patient yesterday, and she said, I went to my gastroenterologist, and I I wanted to show my stool test. He says, oh, gastroenterologists don't look at stool. I'm like, well, then who does if you're a doctor? And I'm like, you know, that just doesn't make sense. You don't look at what goes in and you don't look at what comes out. How are you supposed to know what's going on in there, right? Yeah. And that's the difference in functional medicine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's it really it's it's sort of it's a little bit mind blowing. And yeah, you know, you talk about like you know, uh, but going back to Sid Baker and sort of name it and and claim it kind of a, a thing is blame it. Yeah, name it, name it, and blame it. Um, is that you know, and then tame it with a drug, <laughs> right? And then I I always I always tell my patients, you know, I went from being a medical student to a student of medicine. I'm a, I'd like to always learn about things. Oh, I love and, that. And yeah, and it, and it's a very important thing that you have to remain open minded, and I think you also have to remain curious. Because every patient's different. That's you know that's the, actually the the joy of actually practicing functional medicine is it's not boring no. by any means. It, it, it's a, it's you're you're constantly growing and learning and helping patients with the latest diagnostics, the latest therapeutics to to personalize their treatment, and that's the fun part. I mean, fun, doing functional medicine is a wonderful uh, profession uh, as opposed to regular mainstream medicine where most doctors are burned out. You know, they really are. They're just, they're unhappy. They're, they're burned out. They're, they're doing rubber stamp medicine. You know, I'll see you. Here's your proton pump inhibitor. Next, next patient. That's, yeah, right. that's it. Right. That's it. <laughs> so, you know, doctor sees you, you have irritable bowel, they give you Metamucil. What else can they do sometimes? Well, sometimes they'll give uh, prescription medications. Uh, I think one of the older ones that they used to do for IBS was Zelnorm. Remember that one? Yeah. They took it off the market because it was like really hurting people. I think people were getting... Librium uh, was the other one. Remember Librium. that? That was, yeah. a, that was a, like a Valium. It was yeah. basically like taking Valium. <laughs> is, that, is it Valium for the gut? Yeah. Val yeah. I mean, and I, they're actually, in certain patients, uh, there were some benefits from that because it did sort of calm down uh, the nervous system, I think. Uh, sure. Anybody, that, anybody taking Valium? <laughs> yeah, you're going to feel... I feel good. <laughs> a couple of shots of tequila, a little Librium. I, I feel good. <laughs> uh, right. But that's really not what we do with functional no. medicine. You're, you know, you were talking before about how you never know what the issue is when someone comes in. I was thinking about it. It's much like Forrest Gump medicine. You know, Forrest Gump has a box of chocolates. It's a, Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know which one you're going to get. And I think in, in traditional medicine, you got irritable bowel. It's a thing. You treat it all the same. Functional medicine is not like that. We right. see someone with irritable bowel, and then we go, wait a minute. What is the cause of their irritable bowel? And like right. you were saying before, it's very personalized. Right. So how do we start to think about identifying what their particular issues are? 
Because before we can even treat it, we have to understand the why. And that yeah. is what I always say. Functional medicine is the medicine of why, and regular medicine is the medicine of what. What disease and what drug. And and I think the big thing is time. Taking the time to talk to a patient. And, you know, what? Most, talk to a patient? Uh, actually, and, and listen to the patient. That's wow, actually, listen to the patient. That's, that's actually, you know, that actually and sometimes the less I talk during a, 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 an interview and, a, you know, a evaluation of a patient, the better I do, because yeah. you know, oftentimes we want to jump in and ask this question. They'll oh say something, God. and we ask a question. You know, I think at the, in the average doctor's office, a, a patient speaks for like thirty seconds, and the doctor interrupts them. Yeah, no, actually, I, there was a study published years ago in JAMA. It was eighteen yeah. seconds, eighteen seconds, twenty seconds before yeah. the doctor interrupts. Exactly, because you know we're, we're we're trained to like you know probe the questions, and, and you know they have their own way, uh, sort of path of thinking going down that, but. I think the, the big thing is, you know, we spend a lot of time listening to the patients and getting a history and a story. And, you know, an important thing is an uh, interesting thing in terms of IBS patients is that uh, babies who have colic and they've actually looked at what is it that causes colic in babies? You know, it, you know, and yeah. the latest uh, evidence is that babies that have colic have high levels of Klebsiella. Klebsiella is a bacteria. Mm. And we know that Klebsiella is actually associated with other inflammatory conditions and autoimmune conditions. So Klebsiella excess in the gut is actually associated with ankylosing spondylitis, which yeah. is inflammatory bowel disease, which manifests systemically with uh, arthritic symptoms. So getting a history of colic is important. Mm. Uh, listening to uh, the history of, you know, were they vaginally birthed? Were they breastfed? Um, what type of diet did they have as a kid? And when did they get food introduced? Was yeah, like, yeah, and all those things can play a role in terms of like early gluten, for example, or, yeah, exactly. early dairy, yeah, exactly. Really it, trigger leaky it, gut, and, exactly. And and just there's really you know listening to the patient. Antibiotic use? Did they have a lot of ear infections? Did they have a lot of strep throat? Did they get a lot of antibiotics? Uh, what's going on in the family? Did anybody else in the family have any digestive issues? Um, so just taking the time to get that history allows you to sort of play detective and try to figure out, okay, what are the things that are potentially playing a role in driving this and what might have triggered it? And then personalizing, you know, diagnostics and treatment and everything else. It's it's all about personalization. I think it's very, very different what you're what you're saying. This approach really is is being a medical detective. Absolutely. And and and, and it is relevant whether you're breastfed or for example, or vaginally birthed, because that affects your gut flora and the development for your whole life. I mean I I recently read a study that showed bottle-fed babies have a high levels of a what we call a short-chain fat, which is made by the good bacteria. This one is called propionic acid. Now, this is not such a good one, and it's been shown to induce autism in animal studies and has been so associated with autism and ADD. That is increased when you're bottle feeding. When you breastfeed, you get increase in butyrate, which is the beneficial short chain fat that actually heals the gut and Absolutely. Is, reduces inflammation, does all sorts of good things. So we think, oh, it's the difference, bottle fed, breastfed. And that's not to make people feel guilty if they have to bottle feed. You have to do it sometimes, but you can fix that by making sure they have the right prebiotics and the right probiotics. Because yeah. breast milk has undigestible fibers that are prebiotics yeah. and sugars that are prebiotics for the good bugs they, they, that aren't actually digested by humans. So Absolutely. Breast milk and knows that. <laughs> exactly. And, and the other interesting thing about breast milk, I mean, you know, if we could, if we could um, sort of bottle breast milk, uh, it's very, very powerful stuff. There's, there's a thing in breast milk called milk oligosaccharides. And these are very, very complex yes. sugar moieties, uh, sugar chemicals. And they're actually so complex that for a, a long time, science didn't even study them because we they were too complex. It was like this, you know, a Lego set that was this incredible uh, building blocks. And what they've done now, there are a couple of companies, uh, one company in specific out of uh, Europe has actually synthesized one of the uh, oligosaccharides in milk. And there are actually hundreds of them. Um, and these act like uh, fertilizer for the uh, good bacteria. So these uh, these these things that are found in breast milk are very very powerful things. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so powerful. And so so we dig down into the story and figure out when did it start and what's connected to it. Did you have foreign travel? Because pop people often have post infectious irritable oh. bowel syndrome. People can get it after antibiotics. People can get it after any kind of stress or trauma. And you know, and people don't realize that it, it's connected to so many different things. So let's talk about you know what are the, the causes, and then we'll go into sort of a case of how we would deal with this. So what. What are the what are the top causes uh, that you found in functional medicine that are driving irritable bowel syndrome for people? Well, a lot of irritable bowel also is probably misdiagnosed. I think as sort of SIBO. I think a large number of and SIBO is this diagnosis of you know small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. 
So a, b- a bunch of people with their bowel have SIBO or exactly. bad bugs growing where they shouldn't be in the small intestine. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I, I think that we're, we're sort of finding that a lot of these people that we're diagnosing with this catch-all term is real. They're really having potentially small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There are tests that you can do for that. Uh, we do the... That's uh, also known as a food baby. When you eat food and you get a big bloated tummy right after... And as a food baby, that's what SIBO is. Right, because what what's happening is is the you know there's we have bacteria on our skin, we have bacteria in our mouth, we have bacteria in our stomach, the small intestine, large intestine. Most of them sort of live in the in the colon, but there are times when the the colonic bacteria start migrating upwards, uh, and they go higher up, and it's sort of like you know invading a neighborhood. That's, yeah, you know, it's, and, and they it's mostly of, sterile up there. Most, it's yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's, it's not it's it's. I think it was not not necessarily that we always thought it was sterile, but even the stomach has bacteria, in right? It. Um, and but it's just much less, and they're all different kinds of bacteria. So the the lower uh, bacteria are more fermenters. They they ferment things. Yeah, and that's where we get. I think I have talked about that. I and I uh, I've seen this a couple of times the auto brewery syndrome where patients. In fact, I just recently had a patient. Fantastic uh, case. And he actually heard me uh, uh, on one of the podcasts where I was talking about auto brewery syndrome. So I, I, uh, I did a consult with him and he ended up going and buying a breathalyzer. Yeah. And he confirmed that he has auto brewery syndrome because he was producing alcohol. He was driving over the limit. He was driving. <laughs> yeah. He was just short of the limit. Well, saves you money on beer for sure. <laughs> it was no, it was, it was actually quite interesting because he he actually was doing a very strict low carb, no sugar diet. And even with a really really good diet, he was pushing uh, making alcohol. It's really yeah. quite interesting. Uh, so yeah. So but anyway, so uh, you know, talking about you know how do we how do we diagnose this? So you can do uh, stool testing. I like the, uh, the the GI map test where you can do quantitative uh, PCR for bacteria, yeast, uh, fungi. So that's looking for the like the genetic material of the different bugs. Yeah, it's like CSI. Yeah, you see, you see CSI. It's, it's it's I find it to be a very uh, very helpful tool. Um, you can also do the uh, uh, hydrogen methane breath test. Um, although the thing about the hydrogen methane breath test is that I've had some patients who have significant, you know, irritable bowel, SIBO type symptoms. They're bloating. And they're negative. And they're negative. And I think based upon my reading of the literature is that they're probably producing hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. Uh, and I think that when you just sort of get a history of, you know, they pass very foul smelling gas, it yeah. smells like rotten eggs. That's usually the, the people that are producing hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. People um, don't realize that, you know, cows just don't produce methane. Humans can produce methane. Exactly. If you have this. And we measure that coming out in your breath. We measure hydrogen. We have yeah. you take this drink? And that's really a clue that there may be these bugs growing in there and they have to be treated directly. And that can really help a lot of people. Oh, huge, huge, huge amounts. Yeah. And, and, and it's often missed. It's, it's, it's very much missed. And, and, and you also have to do the test properly uh, because, you know, everybody produces small, small amounts of hydrogen and methane. It's just that you want it lower down in the mm. colon and it really be, it doesn't become as much of a clinical issue. Um, the other thing is to also think about in those types of patients is to make sure that they have sufficient amounts of stomach acid. Mm. Stomach acid is very, very important uh, at uh, helping with the proper digestion. Uh, so uh, you can actually do uh, testing for gastrin levels. Uh, and I've been surprised at how many people have high gastrin levels. So when you're, you you do not have enough stomach acid, your body produces more gastrin, which is the hormone to you know pump out more Hydrochloric acid. It's like acid. flogging a dead horse. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would I would venture to say that most people's uh, issues are not high acid in the stomach. It's low acid. Yeah. It's low acid. And we're taking more of these acid blockers, which, by the way, also cause irritable bowel. In fa- so they help your heartburn, you, but they cause you, trouble bowel. And, and, and now there are, there is a role for short-term use of these, these acid blockers, like in the ICU. The studies have been shown they've been very helpful yeah, to course. prevent stress-induced ulcers and uh, 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 hospital-acquired pneumonia. But they're really to be used short term. And when you start using them long term, they are very toxic. Yeah. They are very toxic. They produce uh, increased intestinal permeability. They uh, cause malabsorption of nutrients, uh, vitamin B12, iron, other trace Magnesium, minerals. Zinc, yeah. Yeah. And, and they cause bacterial overgrowth. And, they, and they cause osteoporosis and pneumonia. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Y- y- huge. And, huge. Huge. Yeah. And I actually. I, 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 I am really surprised that these things are over the counter. They really should not be over the counter. Yeah, no, I remember, I, we've, I've talked about this before, but I remember when I was in medical school, the rep, these just came out and the drug rep yeah. was like, these are super powerful drugs. You never want to give them more than six weeks. They're designed <laughs> to treat ulcers. After six weeks, you got to stop them. Don't take them long term. And now people eat them like candy all day long, every day. And I'm like, this is not good. And we see so many complications from that. So if you're irritable bowel, 
uh, is there and you have these acid blockers that you're taking, there might be a correlation. So we talked about SIBO and we, we talked, we could talk about how to treat that, but essentially it's killing the bad bugs and reseeding the gut. And, and what other things are driving your valve besides that? Well, also, you can also uh, potentially have uh, problems with uh, part of the intestine that causes peristalsis. So normally, you think of the, the gut as like this conveyor belt. It's always moving things through. So you eat, and within about 24 hours, everything should sort of move through. And there are some patients, especially with the patients who have uh, problems with constipation, that will have problems with uh, uh, motility, or really motility disorders. And there's a uh, and test- you're just not moving down. Not moving down. And there's, a, there's a, a part of the intestines which is called the migrating motor complex. And you can actually test for antibodies against the, uh, the migrating motor complex. It's called IBS Sure test. And I'll do that in It's some... almost like an autoimmune thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a little bit like a paralysis, if yeah. you will, or a weakening of the, of the gut. And we talked about that earlier, how um, you, you, in some cases, in, uh, you'll have patients who have uh, Lyme disease. I actually had a, a very good integrative gastroenterologist who brought my attention to this is that he had a lot of patients who had refractory SIBO. Yeah. So, they, you know, SIBO was one of those things where it sometimes can come back and oftentimes does come back. And what he was finding is that some of the more difficult patients with refractory SIBO actually had underlying Lyme disease. And Lyme disease affects the nervous system. Yes. He, he tied the two together uh, because uh, there is a, as a paper, it's called Bell's Palsy of the Gut. And uh, in fact, uh, Bell's Palsy is a, where you get facial paralysis. Yeah. And I'll never forget this. When I was uh, in my private practice, I had a, the first time I uh, saw a real acute a case of Lyme disease, the patient presented with Bell's Palsy. So yeah. her face was paralyzed. And I did testing on her, and the patient had acute Lyme disease, and that is one of the known complications. Yeah. And it's thought that also that Lyme disease can actually affect the gut, and you get paralysis and, and, and decreased motility of the gut. Yeah, so, so that is a very important point because, you know, there are the typical things that go on, food sensitivity, yeah. gluten, dairy. Some people react to the chemicals in food that are... Food additives, food additives, food colorings, food colorings, sugar alcohols, people emulsifiers, emulsifiers, all these things that are in our junk and processed food <laughs> do have a huge impact on people. Uh, there's obviously the SIBO. So many people get parasites. Uh, yeah, we, we, little you know, little microscopic hitchhikers. Yeah, and, there, and there's there's one called blastocystis, which is really common. It doesn't it doesn't cause a horrible disease, yeah. but it can cause irritable bowel. And about thirty percent of people with IBS. Oh yeah, this. I, I, I would, I'm going to venture to say that I have picked up a lot of these. I call them little microscopic hitchhikers. And when you actually look in the in the mainstream literature, they, they you know they, they basically say that you know a lot of these you don't need to treat it. So there are times when somebody can you know they have diantamoeba histolytica and uh, blastocystis, and sometimes uh, endolimax nana. And sometimes people will have these and they'll have a small amount of them and they may not cause any symptoms whatsoever. Right. But if I find them in the in the stool test and patients are having symptoms, I treat them. Yeah, absolutely. And then and then there's also other things. People have like enzyme deficiencies we can see on stool tests without digesting their food well. Yep. Um, and also, um, you know, for me, I, I had terrible irritable bowel, you know, almost 30 years ago. It was from mercury poisoning because mercury affects all your enzymes. It basically interrupts the enzyme function of many different enzymes throughout your body, including your gut. And until I got rid of the mercury, my irritable bowel wouldn't go away no matter what I did. Yeah. I just ate turkey and broccoli and brown rice for six months and nothing yeah. worked. And, and that's and that's and, and, and so you have to keep being a detective and thinking about what are all the variable causes. And we look at the stool testing, we look at breath testing for bacterial overgrowth, we look at uh, organic acid urine testing yep. to see if there's markers of bugs in there. Uh, and we, we sometimes dig down deeper to look at things like metals or Lyme or other tick infections. So there is a real deep thinking about what is going on with this person. And it's guided by their history, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's personalized. It really is. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's totally personalized and it takes time to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it, it may take several visits. I mean, you, 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 we have, you and I have had patients where we've been seeing them for a long extended yeah. period of time and they're, you know, they're get, they make some progress, they get better. Uh, they mm -hmm. may backslide, they yeah. may, you know, then they'll have, they'll have incremental uh, things. So we sort of uncover the, as you say, the layers of the onion. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I, I had a very bizarre case once. They just reminded me of, who was suffering terribly from digestive issues for years and years, was overall systemically inflamed. And it turned out he had Babesia, which affected his gut. Wow. He also had histamine intolerance. Histamine, yeah, that's another uh, one. Meaning yeah. Meaning uh, there are histamines in food. And and so he we, we put him on a low histamine diet. We treated his his um, 
his Babesia and whose symptoms got better. So it, sometimes it's a little bit of a roundabout way to think yep. about it. But um, what what case have you seen in, in, in your practice that have sort of stood out for you around irritable bowel? Oh, I recently had a patient who came in with a diagnosis of irritable bowel. You know, mm. that was that was the official diagnosis. And uh, interestingly, she gave me through the history that, you know, her symptoms seem to have been triggered when she had Lyme disease. And her Lyme disease also was complicated by POTS, which we've talked about before, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia, which basically means that you have autonomic nervous system dysfunction as relationship to Lyme. So that sort of- it means when you stand up, you get dizzy. Yeah, when you stand up, you get dizzy and your heart starts going really fast. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, there are certain, a couple of things that, you know, when, that, uh, make me think about Lyme disease. So when I have a patient who's got POTS, and sometimes people just come in and that's their only their only yeah. diagnosis is POTS, I said, okay, well, why do they have POTS? Yeah, I, I, lo I love medical terms. Postural orthostatic hypotension, which is called POTS. <laughs> it sounds like a fancy diagnosis. What does it mean? It means when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. It doesn't tell you anything about why or what caused it. And it's just, it's like so frustrating to me that nobody's keeps thinking about what's going on here with these patients so they can actually fix the problem. Right, right. So so this lady had this history of, of, of Lyme and, uh, and POTS, and then she uh, ended up having uh, cancer of the uterus and uh, went through radiation. She was supposed to get like 25 rounds of radiation. She had to stop at 12 because mm -hmm. she developed diarrhea. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, called radiation colitis. Radiation uh, colitis, radiation enteritis, exactly. And... Um, Believe it or not, you know the doctors who were treating her said, "Oh, that has nothing to do with your symptoms." I mean, they they literally, you know, they didn't want to they didn't want to you know admit that it was from the radiation. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. And then she came in and she actually had had some testing done uh, previously, and what I what what and I think the doctor who actually did the testing didn't know what, uh, what how to uh, interpret the test properly, but uh, the patient's calprotectin was elevated. So calprotectin is a an, uh, a biomarker in the gut. It's I call it like uh, CRP of the gut. So we have this this compound which is called uh, high sensitivity C reactive protein. When it's elevated, it uh, is a biomarker of systemic inflammation, and it's also highly correlated with heart disease. And um, calprotectin is found in the gut, and it's sort of like the CRP of the gut. So when you see so that, you see it's high inflammation. Yeah, exactly. So it tells you, and usually, you know, for classic, you know, what we call irritable bowel syndrome, you don't usually have inflammation per se. There's not really mm. dramatic inflammation. There's dysfunction, but there's not inflammation. So her irritable bowel was actually partly inflammation. Mm. Um, and, and I think that was uh, uh, one of the big things that was uh, driving it. The other thing in this particular patient is that she had on her testing uh, undetectable acromancy mesinophilia. That's a big so, word. Acro all, right, all right. So, so this what is, is a, a it's a it's a mucus loving bacteria, and what we found is that higher levels of this is correlated with leaner body mass, less chance of obesity, less chance of diabetes, and uh, it's also uh, uh, you want to have higher levels of this because it's a protective good bug. It's and not. A, it's not. It's not a probiotic. Autoimmune disease. And yeah. Le increased less risk of cancer. If it's yeah. Slower. yeah. So and it's not a. It's not a bug that you can go out and get a pill for. At least not yet. Uh, eventually we might because uh, it's so so beneficial. But what we find out is that this particular bacteria feeds on uh, fibers, specifically polyphenols. Um, what so are those? Polyphenols are those compounds that are uh, uh, phytonutrients found in lots of colorful uh, foods and vegetables, things like pomegranate and uh, green tea and cranberry. Cranberries, yeah. So your little bugs like cranberry, pomegranates, and green tea. <laughs> exactly, they love that stuff. This is their, you know, I call it the miracle girl. You yeah. know, that's a miracle girl. You put this stuff on there, and the good bugs flourish. There's a fairly new understanding, you know, because we thought, okay, you need prebiotics, you need probiotics, but I think the polyphenols are yeah. also critically important. Uh, to optimizing your gut flora, the three P's. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and the the other thing which I always come back to when I when I think about the digestive tract is is uh, it's a beautiful visual is the rainforest. And for anybody who knows about rainforest, rainforests are full of biodiversity. There's lots of flora and fauna. There's frogs. There's birds. There's all different you know plants, insects, worms. And the more biodiversity that you have in your personal internal rainforest, the mm. healthier you're going to be. Mm. And there's 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 tons of studies that have shown this, and it's a it's it's nonlinear. It's very very complex because there's this whole ecosystem, and there's this cross feeding and interaction that happens when you have a diverse uh, internal rainforest. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I was talking to a, a 
professor at Harvard, who's a psychiatrist and also runs the Department of Nutritional Psychiatry. And she's written a book uh, called This Is Your Brain on Food, talking about the microbiome and its effect on psychiatric illness. Absolutely. So we, we used to think that, you know, the crazy person would have the gut problems. Turns out the gut problem people have the crazy thing upstairs because of the gut thing and fixing the gut fixes the depression anxiety ocd all these crazy things that we, we thought of our psychiatric illnesses yeah turns out they're really related to the yeah. imbalances in the microbiome and the lower diversity and yeah. western societies have increasingly lower diversity oh huge huge yeah, yeah. exactly and, and it happens very very early on is and what what typically will happen is 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 um you know there are there are some people that you know they're they're you know they're very picky eaters and they mm -hmm. will they'll be eating the same food over and over and over yeah. and um you know i always tell patients that you know you want to try to increase your uh, intake of diverse fruits vegetables you know try to eat and see right now in the berkshires you know we have lots of great uh, uh vegetables that are available that you may not get year round um and you know eating uh i, I call it you know you want to eat a crayola crayon box the more color right. you have in your diet the, the right. healthier your diet's going to be and I, you know, I want to come back to something you said before about this inflammation in the gut there's a whole new phenomenon we call pre-inflammatory bowel disease so we thought irritable bowel wasn't inflammatory it turns out even if you can't always detect it it's it tends to be very inflammatory and there are there are cases like you saw of people with this pre-ibd so it's like pre-Crohn's or pre-colitis. Yeah, it's not like one, uh, and, one night you wake up and all of a sudden you've got Crohn's disease. Yeah, exactly. and so there's this level of, of this yeah. marker we check and it's often elevated and people have, you know, not full-blown Crohn's disease, but something's going on in there that's driving inflammation and you have to deal with those factors. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so this patient also had elevated gluten antibodies, right? So she had this low acromancia, she had yeah, elevated, gluten, elevated gluten, gluten antibodies and this yep. high calprotectin. Yep. And, and so this is a sort of a perfect setup for having a messed up gut. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So how do you, how would you take care of this patient then who came in with the gluten issues, the low acromancia, and the calprotectin? Well, I mean to to address the inflammation. And by uh, the way, these are something that your traditional doctor will never look for. Right. That we usually uh, look for in functional medicine at the Ultra Wellness Center. Yeah. Sort of standard operating procedure for us to really look at these things. Yeah, so so you know to, to, to treat inflammation, I always like to check uh, the omega-3 fatty acids. Because um, when you have low uh, essential fatty acids, you're a setup for inflammation. So in this particular patient, the patient had suboptimal omega-3 fatty acids, which are related to eating cold water fish. So I got her to uh, take some uh, supplemental uh, omega-3 fatty acids, had her increase her fish intake. Uh, I used an anti-inflammatory uh, 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 supplement uh, called Ultra Inflamex, which mm. has uh, it's, it has a, a powder curcumin and other things to help decrease inflammation uh, in the gut. Ginger, rosemary, Gin exactly. Yeah. Ginger and rosemary, exactly. And then also used uh, Interagam, which is a uh, immunoglobin um, that helps with uh, patients who have uh, sort of uh, diarrhea type. Uh, that's actually a prescription medication. So, so tell us more about what it, what is this immunoglobulin stuff? Because you hear a lot about it, and yeah, it's it's serum bovine uh, derived uh, immunoglobin, and it's basically colostrum yeah you can think of it as like colostrum I mean, yeah colostrum is you know colostrum is that stuff that in mother's milk that is before the milk uh comes on and it so gives immunity to the baby exactly it gives right. him yeah it's it's so, passive immunity so it, it's the mother's immune system that's passed down to the child so mm -hmm. which is really quite amazing when you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint that the mother's immune system has evolved and learned what to deal with and how to deal with it. And then that immune system gets literally transferred in the breast milk to the baby. Until the baby can actually develop its own. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, and, and, and the interesting thing is our immune system has to learn. It's yeah. got it's got to be it's got to go to school. Yeah, and 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 that's why you know when you see these little kids who are crawling around on the ground and they're putting stuff in their mouth, we're developing what's called mucosal tolerance. It's yeah. the immune system learning to deal with the planet Earth, and it, it you know it, it realizes that okay you're going to be around a lot of these things you don't want to overreact to it, um, and so you know we we always talk about you know what is a healthy immune system? Well, a healthy immune system is a tolerant immune system. Yeah, it doesn't overreact or underreact. Exactly. It, it, that's that's the key thing. And I always say to people, I want a strong immune system. Well, if you have a too strong immune system, that's called autoimmune disease. Right. When your body's reacting to everything and it's like overreacting. So uh, having uh, tolerance and mucosal tolerance is really really important. And the other thing, which I in some of the lectures I do, and I I, I like to emphasize this is. 
You can think of, you know, we have the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and unfortunately, Tanglewood is is not <laughs> not open this season because of COVID. But in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, you have the conductor, and the conductor, you know, balances the the the, the woodwinds and the and the strings and everything, and they sort of keep everything in balance. And in the immune system, we have uh, cells called the T reg cells, and the T reg cells regulate the immune system between the, the various parts of. So, the, like, make sure it's not too hot, not too cold. Exactly, exactly. And guess what helps with T reg cells? Fiber. What? Fiber. Yes. So that when you're eating lots of fiber, you upregulate your T reg cells. Uh, other things that can do that, vitamin A can do that too. But but fiber is probably one of the biggest things that helps with the T reg cells. Yeah, and functional medicine is really. Uh practical too because when you have a patient with any condition particularly with gut issues which is often driving so many things so even if you don't have quote irritable bowel a lot of health conditions are driven by imbalances in the gut like we talked about psychiatric issues heart disease obesity uh, but we have a very specific framework called the 5r program which we yep. use to methodically treat and restore gut function and we've been doing it for decades even before people called it the microbiome our goal is to really optimize the microbiome as a way of treating all sorts of diseases. So how, how would we do that in this patient? Obviously, you've got rid of the gluten, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, in, in, a, in, a patient, uh, in a patient to uh, decrease inflammation, uh, you can decrease the foods that you know, typically uh, drive inflammation. So things like trans fats can drive inflammation. Sugar drives inflammation. Um, dairy, a big thing. Uh, especially cow's milk. Uh, mm. Sheep and goats tend to be less inflammatory. I'm not sure why that is. This is the A2 casein. No, oh, ET casein. Okay, that's yeah. it. There you go. A2 yeah, A1 casein. casein is very inflammatory, which is all the modern cows. All the heirloom cows and sheep and goats still have A2 casein, which is less inflammatory. Yeah. It tends to cause less digestive issues for people. Yeah. And then uh, gluten is a, is a big driver. And then other things that um, you know are found in foods, uh, like we talked about, things like emulsifiers and artificial processed foods. Processed foods, exactly. If you can't read it on a label, don't eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't don't eat it. Um, the another one, which is I'll mention this, is uh, titanium dioxide. Yes, I was just reading about that. Exactly. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's bad. It's a, it's the a thing that they add to food to white give it, give it white whitening. And they'll use it in a lot of products, gums. They use it in such. It's in a lot and, of vitamins you get at the at the drugstore too. <laughs> exactly, and and titanium. Your your body does not like titanium. It's not. It's a, it's a metal, and uh, it, your body can react to it. And it's it's almost like a nanoparticle metal that you're mm. putting in the body, and uh, it's been shown to uh, the, the gut does not like it. Yeah, one more reason to not eat processed food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So so you've gotten we're removing the foods. We're removing. These processed ingredients, removing trans fats, gluten, dairy, other food sensitivities. I had a patient, for example, I had diarrhea for years and years. It turned out she had a sensitivity to eggs. It wasn't an allergy. She got rid of the eggs and her diarrhea went away. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and there are some times where, you know, doing a strict elimination diet to try to tease out because food is complex. There's lots of things when you're eating food. Mm -hmm. And there are also some, some patients that you, I know you've probably done it yourself where sometimes you've got to put them on what's called an elemental diet. Yeah. Where you basically give them the, a, a, a pre-digested, pre -digested, exactly. Yeah. And that helps to sort of calm down and quiet the gut. In fact, mainstream doctors will do that for patients where they'll, uh, they'll actually put them on parental uh, nutrition, where they just give them it through the, they sort of rest the gut. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be having a podcast with one of our nutritionists. We're going to be talking about the elimination diet and why we do it and how we do it. And there's lots of different versions, particularly for IBS, the FODMAP diet. There's a specific carbohydrate diet. There's yeah. a traditional elimination diet. So I think I think this is a and a really important thing is to get rid of the things that are causing the problem. Yeah. And then we look for parasites and other bad bugs, SIBO, breath testing. So we actually clear out all the bad stuff. Yep. And yeah. Take out take out the bad and put in the good. What's the next step for how to repair the gut on the five R program? Uh, well, you can you can uh, re inoculate. You, sometimes you can use probiotics along with prebiotics. We call that symbiotics. The, the big thing you got to watch out with that, and you probably have seen this, is if you add that in too soon, you can actually sometimes flare up bloating symptoms. Yeah. It's like yeah. a war between the good guys and the bad guys. So you got to clear out the bad guys first. I call it the weeding, seeding, and feeding program. First, it, you got to do the weeding, then you got to seed the good guys, and then you got to feed them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then the other thing that's also important, just that sort of helps with digestion, is, and, and I've been using this more and more, is stimulation of the vagus nerve. So, the, the vagus nerve, um, you can, we have the autonomic nervous system in the body. And there's I, I, this, my analogy is the, the gas pedal and the brakes. 
And mm. the gas pedal is a sympathetic, so it sort of gets things going and the brakes sort of slow things down. So the stimulating of the vagus nerve is resting and digesting. Mm. And that's what you want to be doing. You want to be in a relaxed state when you're, when you're digesting your food. Um, and we tend to have a sympathetically driven society, you know, yeah. we're running, going, we're, you know, uh, always on the go. So people say prayers or grace before eating to calm everything down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we yeah. just kind of eat on the run, eat on the car. Yeah. And people walking down the street. And we, we're all guilty of that. People we, are watching TV. Well, yeah. That, that, the worst thing is actually, I call it unconscious eating. You know, it's like you're sitting in front and watching a movie and you get the popcorn, all of a sudden the big bowl's gone. <laughs> well, they, they've actually done those studies where they literally have a secret trap door on the bottom of the bowl and they like fill it up from the bottom <laughs> and people just keep eating and eating. Exactly. <laughs> unconscious eating. It's like, it's like stop. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so the five R program is basically remove the bad stuff. Uh, basically replace the things that are missing the digestive enzymes like digestive enzymes acid. and prebiotics re-inoculate and then repair which is repair, the next yeah. phase which is how do you fix a leaky gut right yeah the, and that that's you know you talked about butyrate butyrate is one of the things that's very helpful for leaky gut and i've been using that uh in in uh, supplement form yeah uh i also encourage you know fiber fiber use and um uh, glutamine can be very helpful. Mm. Uh, aloe is, can be really helpful. Uh, quercetin or yeah. other, other things that vitamin A, zinc, zinc, fish oil, zinc yeah. yeah. Zinc, uh, zinc in the form of zinc carnosine is also, there's some really interesting studies on that with leaky gut. Um, cause when you take things like, uh, Advil or, uh, uh, Aleve, those things cause transient leaky gut. Mm. So you're going to have, you're going to develop leaky gut. And for people who are taking them chronically, they've shown that just taking zinc will help repair the gut with uh, the NSAIDs. That 1961 American Heart Association policy was the first time anywhere in the world that people were told, cut back on meat, cheese, eggs in order to prevent a heart attack. And that was the beginning of it all. So it's really important to say that at that time, it wasn't the total, a low fat diet. They yeah. didn't say reduce fat overall. It was just saturated fat. No, in fact, there was a lot of evidence that around that time that carbohydrates were driving obesity and carbohydrate restriction was a standard recommendation for weight loss. Yeah, and also for controlling diabetes. It was, mm -hmm. you know, in the early 1900s. And actually, there was a, a, a large amount of science on in the early 1900s, mainly in Austria and Germany. And the story is that that science disappeared with World War II. Those yeah. scientists kind of like were dispersed. But they had done the science on showing how weight gain is really not controlled by energy in, energy out, calories. calories in, calories in, calories in. It was really controlled by hormones. Yes. And they understood that. Yes. They didn't, at that point, understand that it was the insulin hormone, which turns out to be the m most powerful hormone for fat deposition. But they understood there was something going that was controlling fat deposition that was not about calories. And then all that was lost, Yeah. that science. It was all written in German. And then the whole field of nutrition moved over to the United States, didn't read the German articles, and then was just lost. So instead, center stage is Ansel Keys and his colleagues, and they become the most influential nutrition scientists of the 20th century. They, they're they very closely tied in with the National Institutes of Health, that they're the people of all the money for all the research yeah. grants. They kind of take over the whole nutrition establishment, really. Mm. Um, they, they're the editors at all the major journals. They're the top people at all the expert conferences. And they suppress dissent. Right, like so this John Yudkin was another scientist at the time that was showing that sugar was really the driver of right. all the cardiovascular risk factors. Yes, and so they completely silenced him, and he ended up sort of dying in disgrace at the end of his career, basically kicked out of his lab in London, and uh, right. the, the high fat crew didn't do well, and the low fat crew. <laughs> ascended <laughs> well there were these were you know so these were like yudkin as you say he was a professor um in in london um at london university his theory was that it was sugar that caused heart disease and there was another man uh uh md in the u.s called stefansen and he had traveled all over with the uh, the inuit in in the arctic the canadian yeah. arctic and it was and he saw them being devastated by carbohydrates so it was his theory that it was carbs and sugar so there were these other thinkers with other hypotheses and it is true that they were uh silenced i mean which is a shorthand way of saying like they were criticized they were they were told that 
um, you know, really in the same way that we see today. They're they're accused of being backed by industry. They were um, their science was attacked. They were attacked. They were um, they couldn't get their papers published in journals. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the way that science is is silenced. Yeah. Um, and the data that that Dr. Keyes used was based on looking at patterns of consumption of foods in a certain number of countries in Europe. There were seven countries. And it was just looking at correlation. And most people don't understand that science is not all the same. Science that shows correlation doesn't prove anything. It just shows a correlation. I could wake up every morning, the sun comes up. They have nothing to do with each other, but there's a 100% correlation. <laughs> I'd like to see the sun <laughs> shines because of you, Mark. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but I don't think that's it. I don't I don't believe that. And I, and I think that they... they tried to follow up on that research because they believed the theory and they saw this association. But when they did the follow-up research, it was fascinating because they did a study that could never be done today that was unethical. It was 9,000 patients in mental institutions who were captive. They gave half of them high saturated fat diet and half of them vegetable oil or corn oil. And they were sure that the corn oil group would do better, have less heart attacks, less deaths. And in fact, their cholesterol dropped on the corn oil but their heart attack rate and death rate was dramatically increased. For every 20, 30 point drop in cholesterol, there was a 22% increase in heart attack and death. And they suppressed that data for 40 years because they didn't believe it and they didn't want to publish it. And it was just published a couple of years ago. So yeah, that's the Minnesota Coronary Survey. Ansel Keys was one of the primary investigators and you're right. It was the biggest, most ambitious test ever funded by the National Institutes of Health of his hypothesis, right? And they and and at the end of that study what happened was they did actually publish it in 1979, but the but that was 16 years after they had finished the study. So they study results come out, they don't publish them for 16 years and they finally put it in this little out of the way journal that they know nobody will read. And when the one of the investigators was asked why wait so long, because it is, of course, a form of cheating in science not to publish your results. And um, he said, well, there was nothing wrong with our data. We were just so disappointed in the way it turned out. <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't there more data that came out. So then, yes. Yeah, so this is so then in 2015, these researchers uh, at NIH went back to that study and they went back to the son uh, of the investigator and they they found out that in the basement there were these magnetic tapes from the study that had never been fully analyzed and they analyzed them and they used special machines to try to get the data off of them and they discovered that they had never published the full results. And and so in 2015, they published a result that actually the more the men lowered their cholesterol, the higher their rate of yeah. heart dying from heart disease. So everything that, so, and this is the exact opposite. And the butter group did better, basically. And the butter group did better, right. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, and, and actually, so the story is, um, the bigger story is that that study, the, the, the idea that study results are ignored, not published, that is not the only example of that. I mean... Yeah. And this was a randomized control trial, which is the highest level of evidence. It's not like a population study where you can see a pattern, but you can't prove anything. Right. This data is more convincing. Right. So this is the kind of data, randomized control clinical trial, gold standard of evidence. It's where you can demonstrate cause and effect, right? That's what they do for drug trials. They, they, show, they have to do a trial to show cause and effect. Otherwise, as you say, it's just this kind of weak observational data. That data relies, it's, it's data relies entirely on people um, recording what they ate. Right. You know, these food, food frequency, frequency questionnaires. questionnaires. It's yeah. like, what did you, how many peaches did you eat in the last six months? Now, how many pears did you eat in the last six months? And then like, and repeat that for other 200 items on the list. Yes. And then as Somebody asked any, me what I ate yesterday, I can't even remember. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember like, what I ate this morning. So that data has been shown to be just notoriously unreliable, right? And they can't, um, and they've actually tried, they've actually done tests on it, you know, to see what do people actually eat and then what do they remember they ate. People, it's all confounded, like the fatter you are, the more likely you are to lie about the data. I mean, it's really fascinating, but the point is- It also is, depends on what the prevailing view is. If you think meat is bad and you eat meat, you're gonna minimize you're your gonna, reporting of how right, much meat you ate. Right, and you minimize your sugar. They've, show, they've shown that people under will under-report how much sugar they eat and Mm-hmm. They so, overestimate the exercise and unreport the <laughs> time. Well, that just sounds like human nature to me. But yeah. I think that the point is, is that's really unreliable data. And that was the data that Ansel Keys used as the foundation for that first American Heart Association policy. But then, you know, and that was in 1961. So what I want to say is that the, the what happens after that 
1961 policy is the government, the U.S. government and governments around the world realize, okay, we have to test this more rigorously. So they did these trials, these government funded trials, including this Minnesota coronary survey. They actually tested like more than 75,000 people all over the world in a number of randomized controlled clinical trials. That's again, gold standard of evidence. And I, and I describe these trials in my book. I mean, they were as you say, many of them, the kind of experiments you couldn't do anymore because they were in mental hospitals. You're not allowed to do that anymore right. if you like force people their food. But they were really, that makes it very what we call well-controlled, meaning you're controlling everything that everybody's eating. Yeah. It's not like giving somebody a diet book and saying, you know. Eat and, and, this, right. Yeah. And then you don't know what really happens. So, and none of those experiments could show that, that, that replacing saturated fat with vegetable oils was able to prevent heart disease. Or, or cardiovascular mort or death, right? None of them. One of them that was done in Australia showed that the men on the corn oil diet died at much higher rates um, than people on the regular diet. And none of those, I think the kind of the blockbuster thing to me, which I didn't even really know until after my book was published, is that none of those studies, the billions of dollars spent by governments around the world, none of those studies have ever been reviewed by our dietary guideline committees, which is our like our expert bodies making our national food policy. Extraordinary. They've, they've just ignored all those well, trials. Like your best possible evidence on fat and saturated fat was completely ignored. Paid for by, by our, taxpayers everywhere. Right. And by and it's absent from our guidelines, which we're going to talk about. So back to Dr. Keyes, because I think it's a fascinating story. He at the end of his life changed his mind, didn't he? He did on cholesterol. He decided that dietary cholesterol, which is, you know, why you have egg white omelets instead of regular omelets. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, in the late 1980s, he said, you know, I don't think cholesterol is such an issue. Um, yeah. And he recanted on that part. I don't, and, and I think, I don't think he ever recanted on saturated fats and, that I know. And the, the data from that study, you went back and looked at it. And what was fascinating to me was that the signal that came up even far stronger than fat was sugar. Yes. So this is going back to the seven country study where they looked at what people ate in seven countries and then they looked at to see who died and who had heart attack. And what he decided was that it was a saturated fat consumption that was most closely correlated with your likelihood of death, right? Uh, it turned out, or cardiovascular death. But um, so I went and looked at that study in a lot of detail. And, and one of the things that I found was that that later on when they reanalyzed the data, they found that sugar and sweets were actually much more highly correlated with cardiovascular death. Mm -hmm. And I actually asked some of Ansel Keys' colleagues, like, well, why did you not report on sugar? And they said, well, we had discussions about it, but um, Keyes was just so opposed to the idea that it was sugar that caused heart disease. And he was very sure of his own idea that it was fat. So, I mean, one of the things about Ansel Keys... So is much for the purity of science and independent researchers, and, right? It's I, just, I mean, I, honestly, Nina, when I was in medical school, I thought that science was this beautiful, pristine, <laughs> you know, honest field full of integrity and truth. And as I've learned and as I read the data, it's highly influenced by the food industry. It's highly influenced by bias. It depends on the design of the study and who's looking at it, who's paying for it. It's fascinating. And Mary Nessel is writing a new book about how the nutrition science that we have is corrupted by the food industry, which basically obfuscates the truth. And they try to promote basically false science, like fake news, yeah. like soda doesn't cause obesity and dairy is great for your bones and all sorts of ideas that we have pretty uh, much taken on in the society are, are often corrupt by the food industry. So science yeah. is not this pure field of truth. It's yeah. essentially a often corrupt thing. And, and you, know, you have to know how to read it and think about it. And that's what's impressive in your work is that you really go through the nitty gritty and you don't just look at the headlines, you go between the lines, you look at the data, you look at the appendices of the data, you look at the appendices, the appendices <laughs> of the data, and you really kind of find out what, what's going on. It's very impressive. Well, thank you. I mean, but like you, I started off thinking like science was this sober, reasonable, rational, rational process. I mean, my father is uh, a scientist and a, was a professor at Stanford and, and, you know, his journals, like you open up his journals and, and, and there's like math problems on the, <laughs> the page. Like, I, I mean, I just grew up in this world thinking this is, you know, science is about responding to observations, honestly. And then if you're, if your explanation doesn't, doesn't explain the observation, then you have to change your hypothesis. But 
The thing about nutrition science is, you know, the food industry is huge and they have a stake in what nutrition science says. If there's a study coming out that says that, you know, five walnuts a day helps, you know, lower your risk of heart disease, you can be sure the walnut industry is probably behind that study, but it makes a big difference for them. Like what can they put on their packages and, mm -hmm. you know, can they claim they lower heart disease? So the food industry is really, and they know how to corrupt science at its very source, right? Yeah. They know how to fund studies and get them, get, you know, how to, how to distort the, even the study design so that yes. they can get a favorable response. But I think in this field, there's another factor play, at play, which is maybe even stronger, which is that, is that the scientists and experts themselves, I, I don't believe that they were, you know, going back to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I really don't believe that they were corrupt. I didn't really find evidence of that so much as I found their kind of, that they fell in love with their own ideas. They were really just unable to see data to the contrary. And they couldn't accept it when when there was contrary data. And, and Ansel Keys kind of did the opposite of a scientist, which he believed that he was right until proven wrong. Yeah. Science, like, you you're know, supposed to prove yourself wrong. You're supposed to prove yourself wrong. And then like only after you gradually accumulate data, do you think like, well, maybe, maybe I'm right, but let me see how I could prove myself wrong again. You know, that's yeah. the way science is supposed to work. So, and then I think the other factor is that these ideas became institutionalized, mm. right? Once they're adopted by public health institutions, the medical government. institutions, the entire government. And then you have this thing where... Uh, the institutionalization of science, it's, it's, it's like institutional science is almost like an oxymoron because science requires self-doubt, the ability to change according to data, the ability to, to be flex, the ability to be flexible. Institutions just need the exact opposite, right? right. They can't flip-flop on their publics. They need constancy. They need to, for their credibility, they can't be changing. So it's very hard once this was adopted by the U.S. government, the idea that you should not eat fat and cholesterol it just became so hard to reverse out of yeah. those positions. It's true. I, I mean, I, I work at Cleveland Clinic, and Steve Nissen is there, who's one of the leading cardiologists in the world. He's the head of cardiology there, and uh, the vice chairman of cardiology, of cardio, cardiothoracic surgery, also had these discussions with me that, you know, they think that the whole idea that fat is bad is wrong, and he maybe even saturated fat, and that's bad is wrong. And yet, at the Cleveland Clinic, when you go into the hospital for heart surgery, you are prescribed a heart healthy diet, which is high carb, low fat. Even though they know that's a problem, it's just so institutionalized and embedded, it's hard to change. It's really hard to change. Yeah, so, so true. <laughs> well, so, so when you, um, you know, wrote the book, you, you know, we had a certain set of beliefs that were pretty prevalent around fat and saturated fat. Have you noticed anything change about our beliefs about fat and carbs in the last few years since you wrote the book? Yeah, I mean, what has the conversation changed? You know, when I so when I started my book, of course, I was a vegetarian eating a low fat diet, and then um, that was in the early two thousands. I used to track what you know, uh, do a word search on saturated fats to see what the conversation was about saturated fat. That debate has really changed in the in the scientific literature. So there's now uh, like eight major review papers from teams of scientists all over the world saying that saturated fats have no effect on cardiovascular mortality. So in the in, in the scientific community, there is debate over that. I don't think it's really changed so much. You see a, many, many more articles in the lay press about it. But there, so, so it's I would an say, open question I now. would say it's sort of a wobbling open question now. And that was not true before. Before 2014, that really was just, it was like sealed, settled science. And now it's unsettled science. Yeah. Um, and there have been two changes that I think will probably really surprise uh, your um, your audience's mind, which is um, how many people know that there's no more caps on dietary cholesterol? In other words, eat as many eggs as you want. Don't worry about shellfish. Eat liver if you like it. That is no longer, there are no more caps on cholesterol. We had them for 35 years. Yeah. And <laughs> I love what I heard about that. One of the people on the guidelines committee said, you know what? We never really looked at the science. We just thought it was bad. So we eliminated it for 35 years and told people to eat egg white omelets. And oops, sorry. And they call it no longer a nutrient of concern, which yeah. is pretty amazing to me. And they did kind of, so that was in 2015, the dietary guidelines dropped that limit. And the American Heart Association did the same thing a couple of years before. 
And that was, and that, and that went, went all the way back to Ansel Keys, right? That was his idea. Mm -hmm. Nobody really ever looked at the science too hard. And, um, and, but they did kind of tiptoe away from that advice. I mean, there were no big headlines. There wasn't a big, there was no, there was no press release around it, right? It's not a nutrient of concern. And we were wrong and we're just not going (laughs) to, we don't want to talk about about it it anymore. (laughs) So true. (laughs) But the other amazing thing is, um, is that they no longer recommend a low fat diet. Yeah. That's pretty shocking. And again, there was no headlines about it. No, they didn't, They just nothing. Removed, removed the limit. It used to be 30%, 35%. Now they were like, uh, it doesn't matter, right? Now they're like, we don't talk about it. So what they did is actually they did a little, it's a little bit of a um, rhetorical jiu-jitsu, I think, which is that they just stopped talking about the low-fat diet. If you go to the to the Dietary Guidelines of the American Heart Association and you search low-fat, it's like, it's gone. Like, wow, <laughs> that was my life. Um, and then... That what they've done is they've shifted over to talking about dietary patterns. Mm-hmm. So now we have dietary patterns, which are all, like, you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, fish, low fat, dairy, and lean meat. And they don't talk about how much fat you should eat. Yeah. So. And they talk about lean meat and they also talk about low fat dairy and they also talk about low saturated fat. Yeah. There's still a cap on saturated fats. Yeah. So that, that's, that, that's why you're supposed to have lean meat and low fat dairy is because of the saturated fats, but the low fat diet is gone. But again, no press release, no announcement. Nobody knows that, you know, they should stop avoiding fat. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's still news. I still go everywhere. I see egg white omelets and skim milk everywhere. And I think people haven't got the news. I'm like, I said, this guy was getting coffee. I'm like, why are you having the skim milk? Well, isn't fat bad? And like, I don't know that that's old news. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So one of the things in your book I loved was this sort of taking us back in history and looking at populations and what they ate. And the truth is that there's never been a voluntary vegan society in the history of humanity. And then in fact, there's, there's been varying amounts of animal food that we've eaten. You know, we, we often ate a lot of plant foods. The average indigenous cultures ate a, up to 800 different species of plants, but they also ate a lot of animal food. And some of the stories you tell, for example, about the Plains Indians who pretty much consumed only buffalo um, or the Maasai had incredible health and longevity. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I include a bunch of examples in my book of populations that ate a lot of fat. Like, okay, so one of them is the Maasai warriors who were studied quite rigorously by uh, a a biochemist from the University of Vanderbilt named George Mann who went and looked at them in the 1970s and discovered they were eating, the warrior men ate nothing but meat, like five pounds of meat a day and and milk and And blood. blood. That was their diet. Total, you know, no fruits, no vegetables, total failure by our standards. And they had extremely low levels of cholesterol. He measured he measured their cholesterol. They had low levels of low blood pressure. Their cholesterol did not rise with age, which was just assumed to be normal, and their blood pressure didn't rise. And then he did electrocardiographs. If so six hundred of them could find maybe a slight indication of a heart attack in one person, so they seemed to be they had seemed to have excellent cardiovascular health, even though they were eating a diet that was the very opposite of what we're told to eat. And, um, and then it wasn't just the average meat or milk or blood. It was grass fed. It was organic. It was heirloom. It was like, it was very different than where it was what they could hunt. Right. Right. So it's not coming from a feedlot. That's definitely true. Um, so, but, but, you know, high in saturated fat. I mean, Mm -hmm. their diet was like 70, 60, 70% fat. A lot of it was saturated. They didn't, they didn't drink like lean milk or, you know, low fat milk. So, and then there was that the Plains Indians who lived, you know, they, their, their main food source was buffalo. All they also had some, you know, root vegetables and they ate, um, so they ate a lot of meat and they were known to be very long lived. There were more centenarians living in the Indian populations, according to uh, an anthropologist report that there were anywhere in the world. Mm. So they seem to be really long lived. And, um, and I include these examples not to say you should eat a diet of milk and <laughs> meat and, and blood or <laughs> buffalo, um, although it seems likely that you could and be healthy. And I'll tell you one more example of that in just a second. But I include those examples just to show these are data points that are contrary to our thinking, right? Yes. So you ha- if you have a theory or a hypothesis, you have to explain this. How can these people even be alive? According yeah. to our theory, yeah. they should all be dead. And the same thing in the South Pacific. They weren't having animal food, but they were having 
coconut fat. 60% of their diet was saturated coconut fat. And that's the most saturated fat we have. And they had no obesity, heart disease, their cholesterol, their blood sugar. It was all fine. It was all fine. And there's a, what I wanted to tell you that there was an actually a year long experiment by um, that uh, MD a doctor I mentioned named Stefanson who had gone to the Arctic to study the, to the, the, the Inuit. Inuit. And when he came back to New York, he decided to, with, along with a colleague, to eat nothing but meat and fat for an entire year. Yeah. Um, and they did this experiment. Was super Part of it, they actually stayed at Mount Sinai Hospital, and they stayed under a team of supervised by doctors. And then they were allowed out um, for the rest of the year, eating nothing but meat and fat. At the end of that, they were they were they had every test they could think to give them. There were six peer-reviewed papers published out of that study, and they were found to have absolutely been perfect health. They could find no deficiency, not even, you know, you think they would have like vitamin C deficiency because they weren't having, I mean, mm. thought, but somehow from the, you know, they ate every part of the animal, they ate the brain, the, the whatever. So they were getting, it wasn't just the muscle meat. So they got all the nutrients that they needed to live. So let's go Incredible. into this because, you know, there are a lot of people out there who strongly believe that, you know, meat is bad and that being a vegan is the way to long life and health and that we should really be eating no animal foods because they promote heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And, you know, this is a huge debate out there. And I, I, I think, you know, I used to be a vegetarian for 10 years. You're a vegetarian for 20 years. Like, how do you address this, this debate in literature? Because there, well, there are studies that show that people who eat more vegetables and eat less meat do better and live longer. You know, there's a seventh country, I mean, the Seventh-day Adventist, there's Dan Buhner's work around blue zones. How do, how do you sort of address that? So I just want to acknowledge there, you know, people don't eat meat for ethical reasons and there, or they, you know, they don't want to eat animals. And that, that is a whole, I mean, I respect that. And that's a, a whole monk, separate, that's, if you're a Buddhist, that's, you know, <laughs> that's your own, that's a different, I, I want to just like, let's just address the question of health. Health. Yeah. Right? And we is can leave like, environment on the side on the because side, we have to address that, but I don't think anybody agrees that we should be eating factory farmed animals of any type because of a lot of reasons for the environment and other right. effects. So putting all that aside, let's just address the, the health claims. Um, so, so there's kind of two sides to this. Um, one is that, you know, is meat bad for health? And, you know, originally it was convicted because it, it contains saturated fat and cholesterol. So cholesterol is no longer nutrient of concern, saturated fats, wobbling. We can't mm -hmm. have, there's no rigorous science to show saturated fats have any effect on cardiovascular mortality. So Meat has kind of been exonerated on those counts, right? And now it's tr there's an effort um, to kind of convict it based, you know, that it causes cancer or maybe diabetes. And all of that data is that weak observational data that we talked about, right? So relies on food frequency questionnaires, really, really unreliable data. And then here's the other thing. There's a lot of contradictory data. A lot of studies show it helps. Some studies show it hurts. Yeah. And it's very confusing. So, and then when they actually, like, what do they actually find? They find people who eat processed meat have, uh, have a 0.18 greater risk of, I mean, their numbers are tiny, tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. And they're so small that they are not really, they're not considered reliable by, you know, standards of the field. So. Yeah. And they're and they're just a tiny other like sort of. Well, just to help people understand that for a minute, because this is this is important in science. Yeah. If you do a regular randomized control trial, that can prove cause and effect, and you may not need a lot of numbers. If you look at studies that are observational studies, which are looking at populations over time and tracking what happens and what doesn't happen, you have to have a big effect to really consider there's any cause there. For example, smoking was a 20 or 30 fold increased risk of cancer with smokers. Right. Whereas meat, you're talking about a 0.18 or 0.2 increased risk, which sounds like a lot when you say it's a 20% increased risk, but in terms of these types of studies, unless it's two or three or four, it's not really relevant. Right, I mean, and the ones in meat are all, all, all below two. Yeah. So again, 0.18 versus 20 to 30. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yes, smoking causes lung cancer. Does meat cause cancer? Data don't Four support that. Four pieces of bacon a day for your whole life increase your risk from 5 to 6% of getting colon cancer. Yeah, so. which based on <laughs> if if you even believe the data, which exactly. is... And, you know, the other thing about that data that makes it unreliable, especially with regards to meat, is who has been eating meat over the last, you know, 30 years? Okay, these are people who don't listen to their doctor's orders, obviously, 
they're, they've been shown to be people who don't exercise as much, tend to be fatter, tend to drink more, tend to, like tend to do everything wrong. They're yeah. the, they're what we call in science the non-adherers. They yeah. do not adhere to anything. Right. They don't wear their seatbelts, you know? So those people They engage, knew it was bad and they still did it. Yeah. And they didn't care about their health and they had all these bad habits. So that's what you're measuring in meat eating. So if you see any greater risk of disease, if you're seeing it, it's, it's it, it could be any one of these factors and they can't really control for them in these studies. Right. They can't go around and saying like, you know, tell me about your risky behavior. You know, so, so that's also makes that data unreliable. So I don't see any rigorous, by that I mean clinical trial data showing that meat is bad for health. In fact, uh, there are a bunch of clinical trials that I've just been reading that show that looking at lean meat versus regular meat, not lean. So all of your cardiovascular risk factors look better on regular meat. If you love that last video, you should definitely check out the next one on food is medicine. Even gun violence, it's connected to our diet because our diet shapes our thoughts, our feelings, our moods, our brain function, and activates the fight or flight response. Literally, when you eat junk food, you activate cortisol and adrenaline. It's literally like you're being attacked